What's up guys, it's Justin Khan. Welcome to my new podcast, The Quest, where I dive into the ups and downs of trailblazers around me to help you figure out life and get to where you wanna go. As always, before we start, smash subscribe and ring that bell for unfiltered conversations on entertainment, the arts, tech, wellness, how to live, and much, much more dropping every Tuesday. Today we go way back. Emmett Shear is my co-founder and the CEO of Twitch. I've known Emmett for over 30 years and we've been through some pretty crazy stuff together. You might have heard me talk about Twitch, but here's the other side of the story. Please enjoy. All right. So Emmett, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. You are my oldest friend. I think I remember at my uh, at my wedding, you, you mentioned a fact that uh, I thought was pretty crazy, which is that we have never lived more than a mile and a half apart uh, for, you know, our entire lives, basically, I guess up until the pandemic. Yeah. yeah up until the pandemic, we, we both went and scattered the winds as we tried to escape the, uh, the urban blight of, of everything being closed. But yeah, it was, it, I thought I was thinking about it during your wedding. It's crazy. Cause we, we grew up three blocks away from each other roughly. And then you know, in college, we were in the same city. And then after college, started a company together. And even when we weren't working together, we like lived in the same neighborhood. It's, it's wild. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we're lifelong friends. And, and, you know, I've, I've known Emmett, I think since we were eight years old, we went and ended up going to the same private school in Seattle, which was actually not near where we lived. It was like very, very far from where we lived, but was a, it was called the Evergreen School for Gifted Children. And then once we were admitted, they removed the gifted children yeah, from the name. A couple years later, they were like, no, 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 not, yes. not, not having any of that anymore. The Evergreen School for Children. Uh, <laughs> and then um, we were always so into ideas back then. Like um, we, Evergreen had these walkathons where we'd like walk around the lake. You know, you read this like ostensibly a way to raise money for for Evergreen. I guess I guess it was where you'd like convince people to donate for however many miles you walk. Right? They would donate like one dollar per mile or something, and then you collect all these like dollars per mile. And then I guess it was kind of like Patreon actually, <laughs> but like you collect all these dollars per mile, and then you as a kid would walk around this three mile long lake in in Seattle called Green Lake for as much as you could take, I guess, all day, right? And people would walk around like eight times or 10 times or something like that. And then, you know, we were like slowly raising money for for some evergreen cause. But I remember doing that with you a lot of times when we were kids and just talking about, I don't know, diff- different ideas. Yeah, whatever came, whatever like concept about the world came to mind about how how the universe worked, how society worked, how we should go build this thing, we should go do this and like, I have a very sharp memory of uh, being in your house, I think in middle school, maybe like, maybe it might be later in high school, actually, I'm not exactly sure, but the room is really clear to me. We're in the back room upstairs that's like really cold and we're reading about Scientology <laughs> and we're, we were just like, they made a religion like as a business venture. Like we could do this. I bet we could make a religion. Like what if we sold sugar pills? But like we were just upfront about it. Like these are like magic sugar pills that like will work via like the, you know, I guess basically it's sort of like what homeopathy wound up being. But like we <laughs> we had this idea that we were gonna like go make, you know, a pseudo religion to make money. That we didn't actually do it, which I'm very grateful for because it's like it was a very cynical, probably not very productive idea. But it was stood out for me as one of those like we just had these crazy, like, well, we could we could do that. We could we should go make one of those or do that thing. And like I think most of them we didn't go do probably probably for the best but but it was this constant sort of like uh uh river of them yeah and i want to tell people about our our nasa experiment actually because i don't think we've talked at all about that ever but you and i we kind of lost connection after after we went to you know k through eight or like a second through eighth grade together at evergreen we like lost touch for a little bit but then we were brought back together by a mutual friend of ours scott uh, who's like my childhood friend, and then you end up going to high school with. Uh, we went to separate high schools, and so at a certain point, we entered this competition together, and it was this competition to to send an experiment from, like basically high school. It was a high school competition for high school students in uh, in the U.S. to like design an experiment to fly into space, like it, as a massive boondoggle. Yeah, I remember when when Scott proposed it. I was like, oh wait, you're friends with Justin. And I think I just like hadn't put together that 
we had a mutual friend, even because I gotten to be pretty close to Scott. And I think I didn't really realize that you were also a close friend to them. And I lost touch with basically everyone I went to Evergreen with, because after being together from second to eighth grade in this tiny, like 28 person class, I think we all kind of couldn't. Well, it was stand very toxic. Anymore. It was very toxic. It was kind of like. Yeah, it was very toxic. It was like kind of like Lord of the Flies in that, like, you know, was, it, I mean, I guess that's kind of everybody's adolescent experience, right? Like you well, go through middle just, school. And, yeah. It had been such a tiny group of people that every person you had this like layered relationship of every wound, every like thing that had happened. And it was very hard to, to be a new person because all these people knew you as your second grade self, as your fourth grade self, as your sixth grade self, and, like people change a lot from second to eighth grade. And it was very hard to break out of that that perception everyone else had of you that was very, it felt very straight jackety, I think for most of us there, I think for pretty much everybody. And so I think everyone had this reaction of like, I want to be a new person. I don't want this anymore. And everyone like rejected being connected to everyone else at the high school. And then I, I reconnected with people afterwards. I reconnected with you obviously, but uh, others as well. I think we were ready eventually, but really needed some, needed some space. So when I heard Scott propose that oh, we should do this project, I was like, wait, you know, there's like this weird blast from the past moment. Um, I'm really glad we did it though, because it's, it actually reminds me a lot of how we wound up starting companies together, which is like someone, in this case, Scott has this idea of like, you know, we should really do this, this thing. Somebody, we should, somebody should go do this. And then we actually just are like, yeah, we should. And then we just go do it, even though it might or might not be an actually good idea. I like the, I think one of the things that's been good in my life has been just saying yes to those things and trying it more often. Yeah. That's a good point is, is that, that. I think the training with some one thing we take for granted, like I think the two of us take for granted is that training to just say yes, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you've reinforcing off either oftentimes you're reinforcing the instinct to say no to th new things or the instinct to say yes to new things. And I have a lot of, you know, relatives or people that I know who have like reinforced the default no. And I think for us, we've like really reinforced the default yes to, you know, this wondrous world of experiences like crazy, you know, experiences, whether it's this like NASA project or starting companies or Burning Man or, you know, anything else. Yeah. I remember we, just, we, we started like reading about it and trying to invent what our, uh, what our project would be. And we came up with this idea for like, you can grow crystals out of cupric sulfate. So like, like copper in, in, in sulfuric acid solution makes cupric sulfate and you can grow a crystal out of it and it makes this kind of cool pattern when you do that. And we're like, well, what if you did that in space? And in retrospect, I like don't really know. I didn't have a theory as to why it would be interesting to go look at that other than like, I guess I thought it would make pretty crystals in outer space, but like we got accepted. Yes. It sounded smart. The electro deposition of cupric sulfate in microgravity. That was the title of our experiment. <laughs> which, which sounds scientific, which I think we, we <laughs> knew we were optimizing for it to sound scientific, even though I think we also knew at the time that this is not really totally 100% legitimate. Like, what does this even really mean? But I don't know. I don't even sure. I don't even, I don't, I still this day don't quite know what a good outer space experiment would have been for like zero gravity. Well, they, there was this other team I remember that was accepted. So they accepted four teams of high school students into these, this program. And then they ended up flying each of our experiments into space. I think we got like six pounds to go into space to like, our weight limit was like six pounds. And each pound is purportedly like ten thousand dollars, you know, or something. So it was it was a great expense to the taxpayers right, sure. to do this. But uh, one of the other experiments I remember was they took a bunch of media. I thought it was so stupid at the time, but I actually think it was the best one, which is they took a bunch of media like floppy disks and like other types of media formats, and they like put data on them, and they just sent that like the media into space. To see if the data, like if something about the environment would corrupt the storage, right? Like this is like digital media, and that actually might be useful. I mean, I don't know, yeah, but that, it's like that could be useful information in theory. In theory, <laughs> unlike our Whereas, experiment, unlike exactly, <laughs> unlike our experiment, which just sounded sciency. Their experiment is so simple; it doesn't sound sciency, but actually, in some way, really is science because, like, might actually be important to know if floppy disks work in outer space. I mean, not anymore, but like at the time, it might have been important to know. But for our thing, it just sounded sciencey. Yeah, and presumably in space, they were they were actually trying, like, had some sort of media storage that they were relying on, right? 
Right. And, and so this this may have been yielded some useful data. I do remember like mostly though, trying to build it and just like going and going to tap plastics and like buying these little plastic things and to figure out how to cut stuff out of the plastic. And then like getting gorilla glue to glue and like, oh, it's going to freeze. It's going to get cold. So we need like a plastic rubber thing so that it'll like, when the ice expands, it doesn't break the box. And like, just like the actual practicality of trying to engineer something ourselves. And we, there wasn't there was a tech shop and we did zero skills, like no ability to actually like the closest thing to skills we had, I think we developed in Gravitron class. Oh, we should talk about Gravitron class. Gravitron oh, class yeah. is the best part of Evergreen Elementary. Gravitron class was this class where you you got a marble and a bunch of like PVC pipe and heat guns and hot glue guns and like race cars and cups and random like builder stuff. And you had to build a Rube Goldberg machine that worked with the marble somehow. Yeah. It was pretty amazing, actually. That was probably the most creative like class that we had or the thing that inspired the most creativity and engineering and kind of just figuring things out attitude. Yeah, well, I mean, it was that class, I think, laid a lot of groundwork for me for like uh, the idea that like I could have this vision of this machine that I wanted to build. And then I could somehow just like take the parts I had around and the tools I had and like and build it. And, like some parts of it, it turned out I couldn't quite do it the way I thought I could. I had to do it some different way or like it would break more than I thought. But like you could build a pretty complex machine and. And it would really then exist and you sort of from your imagination to reality. Um, and it was, it was the closest thing to a, I don't know, like a kid's engineering class that I ever got as a kid that was like, cause it, we have kids really do writing and really do art, but it's rare to actually have kids get the chance to do engineering. And I think that was cool. It was, it was definitely cool. And I think inspired a lot of interest in engineering and, Later on, when as a freshman at Yale, or maybe I was a junior, actually, we had I took this mechanical engineering class that was like the intro class, but you basically built a robot. Well, the first part was you actually dissected a bunch of machines, like a seatbelt, and you like discover how a seatbelt works, which is pretty cool, or like just common things like a car engine or something like that. And then you, they have you build a machine. It was like the adult or college version of Gravitron class, right? It was like you would build this robot that was controlled by all these like pneumatic hoses and stuff to try to do these simple tasks and compete in this like little kind of like obstacle course type of game. And um, I remember, I mean, that was, it was just super fun and a fun, engaging way to like get people interested in building things. And I think the core skills with like having a hot, the comfort with like, I can just like cut this plastic up and like use a hot glue gun and build it. I can, I can build my electro dip, deposit of cupric sulfate machine out of these things and like oh we need glass with these with your plastic with these properties so we can just go to like the like we can figure it out a good chunk of that came from like i think like, like gravitron class and a few things like that that were these empowering moments of like oh you can build it you do it wasn't totally foreign it was like something i could build on top of a little bit we were just figuring stuff i remember we we had to you know we like had to cut a hole into this plastic box so we could attach the affix a rubber layer that would expand when the i you know the cupric sulfate froze and formed ice right so and uh the standard nasa thing was to add a bubble like a air bubble in so that when the liquid freezes if you have liquid in space it you know and and space gets really cold right when it's you're on the other side of the earth from the sun the space shuttle gets you know below freezing and so the liquid would freeze and compress the air Right. That was the standard thing you were supposed to do. But we said we didn't want an air bubble because that would interfere with the video that we were going to take in, in the experiment. And so we designed, you know, the first of its kind, like it was basically a box with a, a rubber piece that was covering like a hole so that the liquid could be filled at 100 percent volume of the of the box. And then when it froze, it would expand out. And, you know, we just built it in my bedroom, basically. Yeah. And I wonder, like. In retrospect, did we ever test it? We tested it. We tested in my fridge. We te we tested in my fri in my freezer. So we froze the cupric sulfate in my freezer where there's like food that we we're eating, you know. But like, <laughs> uh, and the first ones exploded actually oh, because you know that wasn't you know. And this is like an acid, right? Like so. It, anyways, it, it exploded the first couple of times, but we actually did test it and eventually it worked. I don't know if you recall, but basically when we were at the camp when when we were like integrating our experiment and they, we 
they actually did not believe it was going to work. And we had to convince them that it was going to hold up like this, this kind of structure that we built. And it actually, that's what we did end up flying into space. Yeah, no, it, it actually, you're right. And I, I, I'd forgotten about it because I was like, I was trying to recall the image of it, of the frozen thing. Now that you were saying that like we actually used Kubrick sulfur right inside. Now I remember, because I remember the blue crystals. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like what it, what it looked like. And we didn't know, I actually think it's a lot like starting a startup. We didn't know we weren't supposed to be able to just like invent new ways of doing it. We were so ignorant of like how anything was supposed to work that we kind of had to start from first principles because what else were we going to do? We didn't, we didn't know what we were supposed to do. And I feel like that's a lot of like how we built, when we built Kiko in the beginning or Justin TV, like a lot of the things we built there were like, if I'd known better, if I'd known the standard way it was done, I would have made different engineering choices, but because I had no idea how it was supposed to be done, I just had to like look for the first time. And be like, well, what what is the best way to do this? I don't know. We even know what the right way is. Um, and sometimes you really get a breakthrough that way. I mean, a lot of times you also do a lot of extra work that <laughs> really? waste of everyone's time. <laughs> but but sometimes you really find ideas that you would you know. That there's this really is this value of this beginner's mind thing of like going and not knowing anything and just trying stuff. For sure, and I. So I've told the story a couple times with Michael, and then I, I I just released this episode that was like a, I just walked through my entire entrepreneurial history to this uh, class of Yaleys, uh, Yale students that I was um, gave this talk to. So we've kind of covered that, but I do want to get your take on some some of the, our early experiences. Like when we started Kiko, like our, our this is our web calendar startup back in you know right when we were graduating from college, and that's how we got into Y Combinator. But like we didn't know anything about programming a web app. Like you, I thought you knew what you were doing, but you didn't know anything <laughs> didn't and know. you were kind of teaching me, you know, and, and we were just figuring it out as we went along, which was very ineffective in many ways. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was extremely effective at teaching us how to build a web app. Like I went through a master class in web app building. I don't know that it was very effective in terms of building a web app. And I think that that's one of the best reasons to do a startup. I was actually, I was also giving a talk to some Yale students recently. One of them asked me, that was a really good question, which was like, what should I optimize for in my career? Like who, what company should I join? How should I think about it? And what I said, like, well, if you want the reason to do a startup is not because you make a lot of money. Like you might make a lot of money during a startup, you might not, but you're going to get a chance to do things at a startup or just at a small company where you get to try stuff that's way outside your comfort zone. Honestly, way outside of what you should be able to do. Like you're going to fail, but the ability to get the chance to try those things is what accelerates your learning and what you should be optimizing for at this stage of your career is that learning. And I think that was by far the best reason for us to start a startup. It's like I would have, to learn what I learned over the first two years of starting startups would have taken me, I bet, five years outside of a startup. That's a huge acceleration in learning to like learn that much faster. And I think there's one of the things you also, I also learned that way that I never would have learned any other way. Like I learned things doing it myself and running a business myself and having to figure out the architecture myself that like I might not have, I would have become a better programmer maybe in some ways working in another company, but like the bigger picture and the bigger design pictures, I think would have been harder to like, there's things you get a chance to try and learn by starting a company or by working at a small company that you, you just never even get your hands on at a big one. Well, what were some of those things for you in our early days? Like I had to choose which programming language we should be using. Like in a big company, that's not a, question you ever have to concern yourself with. I mean, you might for a small project, but like you don't ever have to concern yourself with the question at a big company, is this the right programming language? Unless you're maybe very, very senior. Whereas like at a startup, it's a really important question you're gonna have to choose. Or like, what's our fundamental architectural approach? Are we building a mobile app or are we building a, you know, I guess it'd be a thing today. Like are we building a web view or building a mobile app? Like what's, are we gonna do this native? Like those are the kinds of questions that you make you actually make that kind of decision a lot at a startup and almost never at a big company because they, those decisions kind of get set. And then five years into a company's lifespan, they're very hard to reverse and almost never get revisited. So one thing I wanted to ask you about this, this early stage was, you know, we spent that first year kind of trying to build something, but like being very unsuccessful at actually launching and releasing a product. But we actually, it was a boot camp, like you said, in a master class in learning to become good web developers. So we built all of these different potentially, you know, really great startup ideas, but we were very distracted, right? So we started off trying to build a calendar and then we were like, oh, it's not going to work. And we, so we pivoted and then we built a series of other almost like, you know, startup projects or, or web apps that include 
One was like a social network for families. Uh, one was you look familiar.com. You, yes. That was a terrible name. Um, that's a great name. You're totally <laughs> wrong. That was a great name. Genius level. I'm, yes. I'm embarrassed to this day. You look familiar.com. Okay. So that we had a family social network. Then we had a sounds app.com, which was YouTube. Sound, for it was audio. SoundCloud. It was basically SoundCloud. It was SoundCloud, but with no execution, but like it was, the concept was identical to what became SoundCloud. Exactly. And then, uh, we built a, web crawler that scraped myspace which was the social network that was super uh successful at the basically time like, effectively like clout yes it's basically we we're building clout but but again with no execution and and but like conceptually same idea yeah so like to, to determine who was popular and then we built a task like a to-do list kind of i guess it was kind of like Airtable. actually it was kind of like a flexible to-do list mm-hmm. or like list you know um scratch pad or scratch scratch scratchtab.com or something i can't remember yeah there's there's a there's a bunch of them uh well we built an evite competitor i don't know if you remember that one yeah i also remember a secret project which was i actually still think this is an amazing idea and i hope somebody builds it someday it was kind of like trying to combine what became github with like heroku it was basically heroku it was sort of like yeah heroku if heroku let you fork someone else's project the way that GitHub does. Kind of like Replit a little bit. Like Yeah, where... yeah. Like Replit or Heroku. That one we didn't, I don't think, ever get into like a production ready state because building like something like Replit or Heroku is very hard. But yes. uh, but like we were, I think the most important thing about that like period was we just built so much stuff. We were so productive. It may not have been good, but we like, we made a lot of stuff. Well, so at the end of it, we were actually quite good web developers, I, I would say. Like, yeah. You know, I had started from a base of like, I didn't even know how to program when we started the company. Yeah. And you like knew how to program theoretically, but didn't know how to like write anything for production. Had had never used a real database, didn't really know how source control worked. Like I I had a very strong theoretical grounding in programming because Yale is very all about theoretically teaching you how to do things and like <laughs> yes, the, the most important not part. really very much about actually teaching you how to do things like we're actually I'm very, very proud of it and in some ways i think it's a it's a lot easier if you have a very strong theoretical grounding it turns out you can teach yourself the practical grounding but the reverse is not always true and so i think there's something to the the yale approach of like you can figure the practical stuff out it'll be fine we're just going to focus on giving you a very strong theoretical grounding and in, in theory how you would do this thing i mean it basically worked your success story. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was able, using the, the strong theoretical grounding, to teach myself how to do the practical stuff. Um, I do think that there's this, like, you need to get across some barrier of practicality where, like, it can be, seem so daunting at first what, how to, like, even start approaching one of these problems. And if you don't, like, I had just enough practical knowledge in programming that I could bootstrap myself my way up to, like, actually knowing what I was doing. If I had like a little bit less, I don't know that it would have been accessible. There was like this, it was touch and go at the beginning. <laughs> I like didn't know. I It took a while to figure out like how to run code on the server side, for example. No, I remember, I actually specifically remember that when we were trying to set up like a Java Tomcat application to like execute the server code. And you were kind of like, I think I know how to do this. But I, I did not. I did not know how to do this. It was, it was, I, just, I didn't. I didn't understand how any of the actual software stacks worked. Like I could write an operating system. I had written an operating system from scratch myself, but I hadn't written a web server because I didn't take the web server class or whatever. So I didn't understand how a web server worked and no one ever explained it to me. And I, there wasn't, there wasn't the same kind of amazing, like tutorials, like rails hadn't come out yet when we started Ruby and rails yeah. didn't exist. And I remember Ruby and rails coming out and it was like a fucking revelation. That was such a cool piece of software when it when it was launched. Such a good idea. Now it's like, I mean, kids these days, right? Like it's so much easier. You don't have you can write like a no code app. You don't even know, need to program. But like you can, you know, today like you can have your entire backend be run. Like you don't have to do any of the setup and server administration to like make your thing work, which was like a huge barrier to entry. Oh, so what I wanted what I wanted to to, to bring up or talk about was. To, uh, well, I guess it was the trade off. I want to talk about the trade off between focus and like lack of focus, right? Like trying many different things versus focusing on one project. Because I think we benefited from trying many different things, but I actually think any one of those things could have been 
very successful if we had focused on it and been a little bit more dedicated. And I wonder how you remember that time. Yeah. There's a reason in school when they're trying to maximize your rate of learning in a class, they don't generally just like have you do one song for the whole semester if you're like in a composition class or like do one project for the whole semester in programming because exposure to a wide variety of problems and like in the same general vicinity, I think really makes learning better. You gain from being able to see the similarities and differences between the projects a lot. And so I think when you, if you regard Kiko as sort of our one startup to throw away, like purely as a learning experience, I'm quite confident we learned a lot more from going through the phases of like starting the project and like then trying to deploy it into production and then like bug fixing for a while and feature improvement and then starting over. Like doing that six times was definitely more learning velocity than just working on an, an actual individual company that whole time. But it's definitely not the way to like run a company for success. Like that's absolutely not how you go make something that's actually valuable, which is where you have focus. Like I remember when you were explaining to me why you thought we needed to add Michael to the team. You said like you thought he would like bring stability. I don't remember exactly your phrasing, but like he'd bring in stability and help us like stay focused on the core goal and like not lose sight of that. And I think you were very right about that. I think adding Michael to the mix of the two of us really stabilized a an otherwise like high energy resonance mixture. It's like a like a chemical reaction. I think we, we, one of the things that's good about uh, our friendship and about that's, that's become out of us, you know, projects throughout our lives, I think we both excite each other. Like one of us will have an idea and the other person will like be like, yeah, and we should do this. We should do it actually do it bigger than that. And the other person will be like, oh, you're right. In fact, we could do that bigger than that. What if we did it this other way? And that's mostly good, except that it it's like an all positive feedback loop cycle that can send then sends you in random directions that sometimes aren't actually good <laughs> that often in fact don't have there's no discipline or like prioritization or process around it and i think that can be dangerous but to go back to the actual like what did i what was my experience of it was it was a little add it was like it was really driven by emotion like which i think is is a positive we would be excited about the the startup and excited about what was happening and then we'd be like, it would get hard and we would feel disheartened, disappointed. We'd feel like, I mean, I at least remember feeling like, feel, I'd feel scared. Like I wasn't, I was never going to get anywhere. And then I'd think about this new project, which didn't have any of the problems yet because we hadn't actually started working on it. And I'd get excited about that and that would be exciting and energizing and I couldn't wait to get to work on it. And I might talk to you about it and you'd also be excited and energized and we'd like energize each other. And that would be this positive, energizing experience. And we'd go up and do that instead. And I think that that emotional cycle is at the heart of a lot of successful startups and has to be because startups are already disheartening. Actually, just any big project is disheartening. And there's something about hitting that low point and then coming together and exciting each other again about the future and getting excited together about Oh, what we can't, what can we do? Like, how are we going to solve this problem? What are we going to do? And then that energy propelling you forward again. And what we needed to do was to be successful was channel that re-excitement a little more tightly towards the same customer over and over again. Not even necessarily the same product, but toward the same per like if we'd had a customer in mind, this is so funny. I remember this with with uh Kiko. You got off the phone with Michael one day while we were doing Kiko and you're getting advice from him, and he was like, who, who's your customer for Kiko? Like, who are you guys talking? You asked the, the question of startups. And now I ask every startup whenever I talk to them. And we're like, the customer, it's everyone who uses a calendar or could use a calendar in the future. And we just like flat out rejected the idea of having an actual customer in mind. But Michael was completely right. And if we'd had a specific customer in mind, if we'd had someone we were working to try to please, whether even if it was ourselves, that re-excitement loop of like getting disheartened because you the first thing you built did suck or didn't work or didn't blow up. And then getting excited, doing another burst of energy, another burst of like creativity and like working really hard and then trying again, it, it starts to accrete value and build. And like the next one's a little better, the next one's a little better, the next one's a little better. 
And we did that, and it, each one was a little better in terms of like quality of execution. The design was better, the engineering was better, but the because it was targeted in a random new direction, it didn't like build on itself as a company. Um, it only built on itself as like in a skill basis way. But uh, I think we needed that. I guess I don't regret that time period at all. But I look back at it very fondly, uh, and I just I learned so much. We were working seven days a week. We were working like ten hours a day, most of the time until the end. But like, but for most of it, we were working really freaking hard, and it, not because anyone was standing over with a whip. Because I was personally just like so amped like to build this thing I had this vision of, and that was it was super rewarding. I remember that part of my life extremely fondly, and I got a lot out of it. And so, like you know, if it, if if your problem is like that you have like the ADD of like you keep switching projects, like well, we we tinkered with the founding team composition a little bit and that that worked. But I also think it was all it was also just us like getting a little older and more mature and more deliberate ourselves. Like I think Michael helped a lot, but I also think if it had just been the two of us continuing to work, we would have eventually realized like, oh, this isn't working. Like we should take a different approach. We should be more disciplined about this as well. Yeah, that's probably true. We probably would have figured it out eventually without Michael, but uh, we got to give him some credit. So now I want to pivot to telling the story of years later when it was around 2014 and we were thinking about selling the company. You, basically, I remember at the beginning of 2014, I thought the company was worth like $250 million. We had just raised money like the previous summer. You had raised the round from Thrive with a $120 million valuation, right. right? And we thought it was worth more, but you know, it was really hard to raise money for the video people watching other people play video games. Every VC was like, that's stupid, right. except for Chris, you know, who deserves lots of credit. Right. And, and who used the product, customers. understood it because he actually used the product. Exactly. So he he backed us and then we got some other investor investors. You aggregated about $20 million, which was decently sized at the at the time, although for some context. Pinterest, which had roughly the same order of magnitude of users, maybe like double, but not like 10x, had like a $3 billion valuation or something like yeah. that. So it didn't really make any sense. Right. We were underpriced to market. Well, I mean, I guess we were the, figuring out the market, but like, yeah. you know, it turns out that people were not valuing gaming. Yeah. Right? They didn't, it wasn't, it didn't have the cachet that it kind of has now. And so the context was at the beginning of the year, I remember try, I was like, we should try to sell some secondary shares. And I, I don't know if you remember that, but I like made a deck with this like other VC guy and mm -hmm. he was like kind of trying to help us out. And then we were like going around a little bit, not like broadly, but trying to sell shares of like a $200 million valuation. Yeah. And nobody bit. Yeah. Nobody wanted that. And, <laughs> and then, yeah, nobody wanted, no one bit. And then we were, and we were not, I mean, the company was generating tens of millions of dollars of revenue. It's like a real company. It wasn't like, you know, speculative. There was yeah, like, yeah, no, this is, we were, we were operating and growing. I mean, our economics weren't great, but like, that's like the, it's the internet company, like early stage internet companies never have great economics. Exactly. Exactly. You have to wait another 10 years for that. Yeah, exactly. But then it really pays off. The first 10 years is to get the product right. The second 10 years is to get the economics right. And then 20 right. <laughs> years in you're Amazon. Exactly. I mean, I think the, the, lesson for the internet for me is if like you can build daily customer behavior like relationships so there's like there's someone out there who really uses your product every single day and you can aggregate a lot of those people there is almost a zero percent chance you can't make huge amounts of money right like, exactly that's I've, worth a lot there's yet to be a counter example and like <laughs> exactly, exactly. people like keep asking questions sometimes with these startups, right? Like here's people like, like, well, how are you, what's your business model? How do you make money? And I'm like, I just fundamentally don't care about that question because not that it's not important, like you do need to do that, but it's easier by like two orders of magnitude that versus aggregating the daily customer connection behavior in the first yep. place. Yep. Exactly. The daily customer behavior is is everything. Like if you're Amazon, you have people shopping on your website every day. It turns out you can roll out Netflix. Right. <laughs> like you could just roll that out as a as a feature. Well, I was I actually did a good advice to a startup like literally yesterday about this. And they're helping her try to think think through like they had several different 
products kind of that are all together and which one would be the right one to pursue. And I kind of realized it actually only, there's only a small finite number of models for daily customer relationships, right? There's like, basically there's like an app you open every day. There's like a monthly subscription. There's something you use, maybe they're not always daily, but they're like these, these like consistent over time behaviors. And then there's like, the thing that you use in response to some external stimulus, like Uber is a good example of this, where you you don't like think I want to use Uber, but you don't have an Uber daily Uber habit unless you use it for commuting, but you like want to go somewhere and you you are without even with no thought actually, once you've used it enough, you just pull your phone out and you press the button. Right. And or like, like Zoom is like that. Zoom is like that. Yeah, yeah. It's not that you like have a Zoom habit exactly, except that you wind up using it all the time every time you need to do this certain thing. And if your product doesn't fit one of those three cases, like it's a monthly subscription, it's a daily use app, or it's like, you know, a, a stimulus response thing on a stimulus that's like pretty common, you are capped on how big you can get. I mean, you can make a good business, like TurboTax is a good business. It's not like maybe the world's best business, like it's not as good big as Google, but it's a good business. But like, it's just, if you paid your taxes every month, TurboTax would be a great business. <laughs> like you just don't pay your taxes often enough. Don't worry, California is going to get there. <laughs> yeah, they're going to figure it out. We're going to have weekly gonna, tax payments. It's yes. going to be great. Turbo tax is, is has are the lobbyists are already getting, getting ready. Yeah. So okay, back to so we yeah. had we had this daily. We actually had a daily use app, right? Which is that people yeah. showed up and watch video or stream video every day, and it was a lot of them. I think at the time, if I remember correctly, you could correct me. It was like fifty-five million monthly viewers. So with what I understand now, I like look at our customer base very differently because we were counting everyone who came to the website. I think that's about right. If you just count how most companies count monthly users. And I think if you're counting it that way, that's, that number is about right. We now count it via like uh, people who make it to five minutes of video. So with that lens, you throw away all the people who show up and then like don't actually use the product. And you only count the people who at least sort of use the product. And I think at that point, we probably would have been at more like 7 million, but still like, that's a lot. Like if you, once you apply that filter, 7 million is a lot. And we were growing really fast. Like that was not a slope. Like we were growing every month. We were bigger and like yeah. noticeably bigger than the month before. Well, all these other people counted the, the way I was talking about, which is like the most expansive way possible. When you hear like, them say we have 2 billion monthly active users, they don't actually have 2 billion monthly active users. They have like 700 million monthly active users and 1.3 billion people who touch the product at some point during the month. Like that's, that's pretty common. But I actually increasingly think that the monthly uniques is almost as bad of a vanity number as like hits or like page views. Like what you actually, so daily is better. I think daily numbers are like actually more like true. Like when a company tells you their daily number, like monthly, you might have like a 10th as many true actives, but on a daily basis, it's hard. Like if half the people aren't actually using the product, that would be like a lot. And mo most of the companies get to like, you know, more than half are actually using it on a daily basis. And so it's a, the daily uniques numbers are actually much more meaningful at the time. Actually, I actually don't know. I don't remember what they would have been at the time, but it would have been a lot. It would have been, that was the other thing about our product. People who used it, used it a lot, a lot, like many days a month, many hours a day, like every day. And that's like, that's like, and the other thing, the main thing I remember in 2014 was we looked at uh, people who were purchasing subscriptions at the time you could buy a subscription. And the number that I thought was the most uh, impressive that really gave me a lot of faith in the business at the time was our churn rate on a dollar weighted basis for someone who started spending money with us was negative. Like if you were spending $5 a month in month one, you were spending like $7 a month on average in month 13. So like 12 months later, you you were spending more money. And those curves, we had, we had like at that time, roughly two years of data. And like, it seemed like that process was accelerating, not decelerating. And so it was just like, oh, it was really clear to me from that, that even though we weren't making that much money yet, like the economics were going to get very good over time. So I wasn't ever worried about that at all. Like that that seemed like we'd figured out something people really wanted. And then when they, when they spent money, they're like, oh, I really like this. And they wanted to spend more later. And that was like a a very positive sign. I mean, I think it's generally, if, you're, if your product doesn't have negative churn on a dollar weighted basis, like people 
want to buy more of your thing over time after they buy it the first time, you should really like look in the mirror and ask if your product is any good because like I can't think of anything I really like that I buy where my I, my spend on that thing goes down over time, not up. Like it really should be negative, but it was, which is which is very reassuring. Um, so that's one of the hard questions you should ask yourself as a founder. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you're if you if someone buys whatever hundred dollars of your stuff, and then a year later they're spent, you know, they spend hundred dollars in year one, and a year later they're spending eighty dollars on your stuff. Like maybe what you're doing is okay, but like clearly they don't really like the stuff you really like. You should be spending a lot more on. So anyway, uh, yeah. So we got inbound from from Google, being like, wow. "Hey, do you want to sell the company?" I know, and it was flattering at the time because yeah. three years earlier or four years, I guess, they had interviewed us. They had, they wanted to buy us before. Right. And they were like, hey, come in. And then we were actually very really excited at, at the time to try to sell the company. And then we let them interview our entire team. They were like, okay, the final step is to interview your, like interview everybody to see where they would like place at Google or like yeah. what you know um, level they would be. And then they interviewed our whole team and they were like, your team's not good enough. So yeah. we're not going to do this deal. <laughs> like just... yeah ouch so they and came like, back yeah but yeah apparently it was good enough because then we went mostly they wanted to buy but that's, i think that's the the lesson of of startups exactly it was good enough because we turned around and made fucking twitch so so they came back the um and they said i think their first offer was like 150 right plus like 25 million in consideration and in, in re retention i i honestly don't remember but i was just like no I loved that. Like, by the way, I like love the that, that was that was an easy one because I was like, I know we have a something that's like a winner here. Like this is good. This is the, this is really working in a way that nothing I've ever done before in startups ever really worked. Why would I sell it for, you know, I don't remember, but it was, I don't know if it was was one and a half x or two x or two and a half x or whatever, but like some small multiple of the round I just closed. Like, why would I ever like? Yeah. Why would I ever do that? It doesn't make any sense. That was an easy no. Yeah. And then they just kept coming back and bidding against themselves. Those, yeah. Which was hilarious because you were talking to them and then you would like call me yeah. or text me and like be like, oh, they just came back with X, right? It was like, right. then it was like 200 something plus 225 plus 50 million. It, they kept going up very, like, in a very, like, systematic. It was almost yeah, like yeah. too systematic because it seemed like it was very, like, pre programmed. Well, there was also like four offers. And I, and I remember, so I remember the, the, the final call where they were like, look, clearly we haven't hit your number because you keep telling us no, but equally clearly you haven't told me, told us to stop calling you. So you must be at least somewhat interested. Can you just like, we've bid like four times now. What's your number? <laughs> uh, which I thought was a pretty good move. I, well, I liked you. I remember you saying like at one time they came back with like, 300 something or whatever, 350 yeah. or, and you were like, you're more than half off. And then they came and then they made more bids, more bids. Right. And it got higher and higher. And that by this point I was like, yo, we, we should, I was like, what are you, what you, we should take it. And then you were like, but you having uh, had iron balls and you were like, no. And then it, they, they actually got to like 700 something like that. And I remember you saying, we'd like to get to a billion. Yeah. And then <laughs> Then they came back with an offer that was like 850 million plus 150 in, re in retention. So like, yeah, you know. so, so, yeah, it was a billion dollars roughly. And a billion dollars, a cool billion. In retrospect, I only picked a billion dollars. It was I was like, I want to say I had a billion dollar exit. Like it, it wasn't really like there was no real like math to it or like why not 1.1. I could have said 1.1, but like, I think like they actually kind of had to respect like, well, I just. I set out to try to create a billion dollar company. And so like, maybe we're not even worth that yet, but I don't give a shit. Like that's the price tag. And it kind of, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a defensible point. Like if I'm at 1.1, they could come back and say like, well, why not one point? Why not one? And like, I don't know, fucking why not one? But I wrote one, they come back one and one at nine. I'm like, well, that's not a, that's not a billion dollars. I'm sorry. Like I, that, that was, that's the goal. And like, that's like a believable, like negotiating position. Um, right. Although, you know, you could just come, you could come back and say like, I, my goal was to create a $1.1 $1 .1 billion company. It just, <laughs> nobody, it just doesn't, doesn't sound fucking believable. I mean, on the other, on the other hand, I could have just been like, our math says that our forward multiple is worth this. 
like you're welcome to see the math if you want, but I don't think it matters. Like that's the number, yeah. take it or leave it. But at that point, that was enough that I actually did think it was given given where the we just raised it a hundred million, like or like one one twenty or something, like months previously. It was like eight months prior, right? Eight so months like previously, yeah. and by the by the time we got through the negotiation, it was like eight months previously, and like. And it was a good forward multiple in the business. Like that was, we weren't going to be worth that much for a while. I didn't think. I mean, we were like in retrospect, but like, it felt like a good. Like I was like, okay, that's like actually a good offer for the company. And like, I'd hated raising money. I really didn't like raising money the like previous rounds. And so like, the idea of being able to like never have to raise money again was very attractive. And and the idea of like just I think locking in a win was very attractive. Like that you know, it's like oh that's a win. I'm happy with that. Um, I think that actually gets a lot of founders. Like that's a reason why many people sell is that they want to lock in the win. And yeah. Well, because it's it's such a big difference, right? Like if you if you lock in a win, no matter how much money you made, if you get a sell a billion dollar company, no matter how much money you made, how much money you could make, you are always like gonna be a winner. Right. Like your yeah, yeah, yeah. ego is permanently set. And a lot of people have this, you know, you want, you like have this ego, egoic drive to, to make a startup. I mean, that's yeah. part of it. No, that, that totally. I think that was, that was a big part of it. I think the other part is just like, there is a declining value of money. Like, even if you could sell the company for 10 times that amount, the money you get isn't worth 10 times as much. Like the, the first million dollars is worth a lot more than the second million. And the first $10 million is definitely worth a lot more than the next $10 million. And the first hundred million dollars is for sure worth a lot more than the second hundred million dollars. Like, and I think the first thousand dollars is worth more than the second thousand dollars you have in your bank account. Like the, there's really no end to that, right? Like as you get more money, the need to get the incremental next dollar goes down. Like you just, what are you going to spend it on? Like you've already bought the thing you want, whatever the thing it is. Why do you think so many people don't realize that even after they have you know, X thousand or million or tens of millions of dollars. I mean, it's, it's all like, it's all like ego comparison. I remember after, like, after we sold it, uh, I mean, li literally actually why, YC made this worse. They published that like list of top hundred startups and like, it was at, like, <laughs> I don't know, number 27 or something. I was like, fuck, I'm like, I'm stuck on that list now. I can't, I can't move up because I, that's when I sold it. And even if Twitch is worth more, I can't ever place higher on that list. It's all basically pure ego drive. But I think that's like, I think that's like, I believe that that is the primary reason people keep going like for more and more money. It's like the marker in the game for how, you know, how much you've won, how many points you have. And uh, I rarely have seen people have any specific reason they want the money. Like every now and then you find someone who really actually wants like, the, I need $300 million to do this thing. But like, that's very rare. Most people don't have that. I, mean, I think Elon had that to some degree. I think Elon Musk is a good example of someone who like wanted a bunch, had a specific use in mind for more money than one could spend on an individual, like on, on yourself. But if all you're doing is buying shit for yourself and like your friends, there's like a limit to how much of that anybody needs to buy or that'll like make you happier. Yeah. And it's not very high actually, as far as I can tell. Yeah. How, what, what do you think that number is? Unless you want a very specific uh, it, private island or private jet. Yeah, or I think it like I think it varies based on like what city or country you live in. Like if you live in the Bay Area, that number is substantially higher than if you live in, yeah, I don't know, Pittsburgh, because Pittsburgh's a nice city, there's like, great stuff there. But I can buy a really nice house in Pittsburgh for you know a million dollars. We have a very very nice house. A million dollars in San Francisco gets you like a even with the all the exodus recently, a million dollars still gets you like a you know one bedroom apartment and not, not like the best one bedroom apartment. So in San Francisco, you legitimately might want more than a one bedroom apartment, which means you might need to be able to buy a like $4 million home. If you want to like have a place that has like a yard or like place for your kids to have a separate bedroom. But like, that's exceptional, I think in the Bay area. So I think of it less in terms of like, what's the absolute dollar amount and more like, what are the core needs you like need to have money for in order to like, you know, where, where money stops really being a big value. And I think it's like, you can buy a nice house, 
You can send your kids to school, whatever school you want to send them to. You can go on, you know, some fair number of trips every year and stay at a nice hotel. You can like, you know, eat, eat good food and like pay someone else to clean up the mess. I was trying to think of like, and like, these aren't necessarily things you even necessarily want. I'm just thinking like every creature comfort that reasonably like could make your life more pleasant. I don't know, buy Netflix and Amazon Prime subscriptions. Like, <laughs> like the, the real, I remember the, the, like, I, I remember I felt feel like so like, oh, this is so awesome. I have enough money. I can get the Hulu Plus and Netflix and Amazon. I just have all the subscriptions. It's going to be amazing. But like, that's not very much money. That's a, that's a normally affordable kind of thing. Like, if you have a job in San Francisco, most people can afford that. And so, like, I think in like in our society, modern society that it's just like what I don't know what you buy after that. I mean, I think everything else after that is ego stuff. It's like I can go buy like really expensive artwork, like fancy expensive artwork, or I could buy equivalently pretty artwork that just isn't an original, but like it's the same. Or like fancy clothes, or handbags, or supercars, totally. cars, or any anything else like that. One, I think it's one thing I get a lot, and I wonder if you get the same. Is a lot of people just don't believe me you know when i say oh the marginal utility of more money is pretty low you know they're like yeah i think our culture really emphasizes like continued accumulation right and yeah you can see you, because you see people figuring out ways to spend it on like instagram or whatever you see they're like super expensive shit like the, you know the million dollar car and the like right. million dollar watch but that is pointless like that, that stuff does not that doesn't make you happier. I actually believe that being able to travel with your friends, being able to like pay someone else to deal with cleaning your drains, like that actually does make you happier. Like it really is like, I'd rather not be doing that thing. And I'm now happier that I'm doing something else. But like at the, the more expensive version of X, eh, like it's, it's uh, at best, it's like an ego game. Um, but I think that, uh, I think there's something to that ego game. Like I think there's something to the like, motivation for people to keep playing the game because i do think there's actually value at some level like the market does judge one aspect of important value of what a corporation does and like i think people being motivated to like try to turn that number up is generally a good thing although i think that it can be taken too far like you also want the other interests that are not necessarily captured or represented in the market cap of a company to be represented, but I, I don't think just because there are other things that are important doesn't mean I don't think having people being incentivized to increase profit and like generate more wealth is a bad thing. I think it's only a bad thing when it becomes like extractive, when you're accumulating the money by taking it from other people rather than by like creating wealth and keeping a portion of it. And I think there's a pretty big difference there. So what's the difference? Because I feel like people, especially on Twitter, you know, the AOCs of the world, they don't believe it, right? They don't believe that it's not, ex that all wealth creation is not extractive, right? right? That's not from labor, right? So why, what's your best argument to explain that to the radical left that wants to social nationalize Twitch? I mean, I actually really enjoy watching what would happen if we tried to nationalize Twitch. It'd be very interesting. I like, I'm trying to, I'm like, I'm just actually trying to imagine what, how that would work. Like, I'm just imagining like, you know, the president appoints a new like director of Twitch trust and safety moderation. And like that person's basically like, unlike, unlike the current person who actually has a lot of direct pressure because you can like shame the government. Like when was the last time you shamed like uh, the corporations? When was the last time they like changed the commissioner of the FTC because people didn't like the rulings? Like they're, they're totally insulated from public pressure. So I actually think in a lot of ways it would make it less responsive. Like it would do the opposite of what people think it would do. In terms of solving their problems, but whatever, that's a that's speculation. I don't know. Maybe it would work. I don't know. I'd be interested to see them try. Uh, I'm curious to see what would happen. Like, if Estonia is trying to be like this digital country, what would happen if they just started like nationalizing the digital assets and be like, we're going to run the country's social network. This is a core utility, and we're just going to run it. And like, that sounds crazy. Except that we we like it used to be like electricity was a private enterprise, and then we basically effectively almost every country nationalized electricity like it's just provided by the government more or less or like by a private utility but heavily regulated monopoly by the government which effectively might as well be the government and like that works pretty good so i don't know actually it's an interesting question maybe it would work better than we think it's interesting because it works well 
some places and doesn't work well other places. Like we have rolling blackouts in California because probably because they've they failed to like create market pricing for well, power. Well, like, maybe, but there are also pl- country like Texas doesn't have doesn't have market pricing for power either. Like I don't think any state has market pricing for power, and many of them have the lights on. So I'm not convinced it's the market pricing is the power as opposed to just competence of the people and the structure of the like from what i understand about how the california power thing works there's actually the this like multiple layers of regulation interfering with each other so that no one actually has the power to like actually fix the problem but anyways so back to the core question which is like how do you explain like the difference in extractive wealth creation and like creative wealth creation and i mean extractive wealth creation is pretty easy to like to identify right the ultimate thing is like basically like thievery. Like I roll up with my knights and I'm in, and I'm in medieval Europe. I roll up with my knights. And I'm like, that's some nice shit you got there. It's mine now. <laughs> like why well, I, I have accumulated wealth and I got it by purely by taking your shit. And that is like one end of one ex- spectrum of the extreme. And the other spectrum of the, you know, wealth creation with very little value extraction would be like Craigslist, which created this vast amount of value for people and extracted almost none of it. Right, like a free marketplace right. that it creates value by matching buyers and sellers, but actually charges, for most of the categories, charge 0% right. commission. Charges, charges minimal, like minimal fees and uses those fees just enough to like basically allow them to keep running the marketplace. And that's, that's, that's effective. Like I can't not correct this, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is, you, you can't tell me that you like, use like, wikipedia doesn't create value in your life like obviously wikipedia is deeply valuable for people like it's, it's become like the reference point for like i want to know about something and you just go to wikipedia and there it is the article on the amalfi coast or the article on how oxidation and reduction works like whatever thing you want to know about well wikipedia is a good example because someone on the left might say well on the radical left right, right. might say well that's an example of why we don't need to create billionaires to create wealth Right. I, I think that's true, too. I don't think you have to create billionaires to create wealth. I think there's lots of kinds of wealth that get created without billionaires. But I think the the core sort of message that like there's a difference between doing things where you do work and make something and then get paid some amount out of it. So like, I guess by picking Wikipedia and Craigslist, I'm picking companies like didn't extract anything, right? And so they're like oh, this obvious case of creating wealth without any extraction. But like most companies are somewhere in between. They're blended between the two sides, right? Like on the one hand, you've got some amount of wealth being created and they keep some portion of it. I mean, I think actually YouTube would be a good example of this in some ways. Or like Netflix. Maybe Netflix is even better. Like Netflix like aggregated up a bunch of content that mostly already existed and then sold it to people for some amount of money per month. And I think most people would say Netflix is a bargain. Like Netflix like improved the quality of their viewership experience when Netflix launched. Like pre-Netflix existing to post-Netflix existing, they suddenly had access to like far more movies and that was good. Now, if you're going to go down the like the real radical like rejection of property route and be like, and like of, of consumer values route and be like, well, having more movies isn't good. Having more, you know, access to good food isn't good. Like that's like the, you're, you're being programmed to like want that stuff. It's not actually good for you. Like, okay, like fine. In that case, you're right. Capitalism is bad. Cause like it, what it's good at is providing a bunch of like consumer value, like movies and, and cars and, and food. And if you don't want, you don't think that's like good. Actually. Okay. That's a valid argument. We can talk about that. Let's, let's set that aside. Let's assume creating stuff is good. That people yeah, I, I actually don't think that the, the, the people, the proponents of their argument, I'm, I'm saying like billionaires are evil, are saying that they don't want stuff. I think that they want stuff and more advancement of cr- the creation of stuff without creating wealth disparities, I, I guess. Uh, right. I mean, I I do see them mixed together. I see, I see both arguments at the same time sometimes are mixed together. I think they're both important and different questions, which is one, as we make stuff as you, as you as you create value and retain some portion of it a is that possible is it possible to create more about va- create 100 units of value and then keep 20 of them but still net have benefited society 80 
units of value more than you retained? I think the answer to that is obviously yes. Like, but you know, you could I guess go you could question that. And the other one is like, how do we measure these units of value at all? Like, what are what what is the who's who's to say that having better access to entertainment is actually good for people? And like, I guess in my opinion, it's like the people. Like the people who are deciding to buy that thing, like they seem to think it's good for them. Like I don't know, you you well you could decide what's good for you, and you can go buy something else. But I think it's a valid question because see, people clearly sometimes want things that aren't good for them. But like, can you produce the amount of wealth we have in our society today with a lower disparity of wealth, specifically at the high end, right? So fewer people who have shit tons of money more than everyone else, relative to like the the greater populace. I actually think there's two questions on inequality that are all both interesting. Like the question of like people who make five hundred thousand dollars a year versus fifty thousand dollars a year a year, and then the question of people who make less than a million dollars a year versus the people who make hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Like there's a those are two different kinds of wealth disparity driven by I think by pretty one is driven by like relative wages and like the inequality with which we set wages. One is driven by exponential returns to capital for ownership in businesses, which is a completely different phenomenon from wage disparity. So like you set aside the wage disparity and equality question for now, which is a also interesting but different. And you just look at the like some people in a capitalist system wind up with these sort of hyper runaway companies where they own this crap ton of money as a result of their thing getting really big. Is that necessary to make the capitalist system go? And yeah. I think the answer is to some degree. Which I know is sort of a cop out, but like it's obvious that if you don't let people get rich by building businesses, you turn off the spigot of capitalism. Like people have to be able to get substantially wealthy, like life changingly wealthy, much more wealthy than the average person by doing that, or no one would ever go through the horrendous amount of pain, risk, and unpleasantness required. They just go become an executive at someone else's company. Like, there's just no reason to like do it unless you can, unless it it has this potential to pay off in a really big way. You've got to sell the lottery tickets to motivate people. Yeah. Do you need to let people accumulate huge amounts of like, like could you tax, could you make the ta marginal tax rate very high past a certain point? Let's say, you know, past a billion dollars to pick a nice, because we live a billion dollars is a nice round number. Could you make the you know, the tax rate really high past that point. And I think the the answer to that question is you could. I think capitalism would still work. I think you would you would generate uh that money isn't actually being consumed right now. If you want to be consume can to consume it, like to, to to sell it off and have that money be consumed by poor people who need things. So like you want to take that money to, 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 for someone else to consume, then the answer is you can't tax very much of it because like that money is currently being invested and you'll throw off our investment consumption balance. Like that money is currently being kept in stock that like it's basically being lent to the company. And if you try to liquidate money out of the system, you wind up with driving up consumption and down investment and that's net bad for the economy. Like the balance gets thrown off from where it should be effectively. You might as well print the money as take it from them. There's this other question of, could you just take it from them and hold it? Could the government just take that money and hold it and hold like accrue the dividends over time and like do what Bezos does, like, you know, or do what Gates does and just like own the Microsoft stock, own the Amazon stock and just hold on to it. And the answer to that is like, I think the government could, but I don't think that would let you accomplish any of the ends that people on the left would like to accomplish with it. So I don't I don't know that like you know so I, I guess it's like theoretically possible I think you would have to choose that line very very carefully. I think a lot of times when people are making these arguments, they are not making them from a place of here's what we want to accomplish and why a plan attacks these people this amount of money it like works. It's I think there's a you know there's have you heard of the there's this I can't remember what it's called but there's like a five mor moral axes. Uh, I think they mm -hmm. define out of six actually, like which are the different ways that people are like, like the, the different the different dimensions on which people are moral, and you know, there's like sanctity is one, authority is another. So like whether you obey authority or right. not, you trying equality to equality or and fairness. equality is one. Yeah. So right. 
there are some people who are very high on the equality. Compassion. Like some, yeah, something that is like being, things being more equal is morally good versus things being unequal is morally, morally, it's, it's like just fine, right? Like people who right. think it's fine. And I think that a lot of people see, you know, this massive wealth and think that that is just bad. You know, it's right. like morally bad. Well, if I, I mean, if I could just wave, wave a magic wand, I certainly think handing down that size of wealth over generations is bad. Well, those people are going to lose it anyways. I mean, maybe. The Waltons seem pretty rich still. Yeah, it's only been like 50 years or whatever, you know. You think, you think, you just wait now for the generations, it'll all, I don't know, the, the evidence for that, when we, in places where we have long running records, like in Italy and in England, is uh, families that were rich in the 1400s, those same surnames are rich today. So I actually don't, I don't buy entirely the like, rags to riches to rags in three generations. Was it shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations? I don't totally buy that. I think that, I think there is a generational wealth effect. I think it's dangerous. I think accumulating inherited wealth is not good for society because there's, that, that's like just, just dead weight loss, right? Compared to like allowing people to keep the stuff that they created themselves. Like there's, there's no, there's like an argument for the, for, for the entrepreneur keeping some of the money for the, for the really hard, for the great basketball player keeping some of the money. There's not really an argument that at the next generation, their kids deserve to start off on third base because they, their parents had a triple. Like, I just don't, I don't, I don't know if I buy that. I used to, I used to, you know, I think we've talked about this a lot, many, many years, yeah. decades even. I used to disagree with you that, you know, like as I think a lot of Chinese people, ethnically Chinese people are like, oh, I want to do it for my kids. But now having made a lot of money, I don't really want to leave my kids anything. You know, they should, they, they should just do it on their own. Well, it's, it's deeply human to want to take care of your children and want to give them the best possible life and the best possible start you can. And I think that rich people have plenty of ways to do that already. They don't need the ability to leave them also like billions tens of, of millions, dollars. billions of dollars. Like that's, that just seems unnecessary. Like they already have all these incredible advantages from their from their upbringing. Like, really, you need to also do that. Like, you come on, can it be enough? But I think that the the truth is, we could have a more equal society than we have today, and also still have a very productive capitalist system that like makes a lot of stuff for everybody. I think that the tricky part is writing the rules in a way that don't fuck everything up. And I think that's way, way harder than people give it credit for. The cascading series of unintended consequences. Yeah. So I have this like this this new sort of thing I keep bringing up when I talk to people about about these issues. Actually, I bring it up at Twitch when we're designing systems, which is that like organizational work is work. Like uh, coordination is work. Figuring out who's going to do what, where, and how much of which things we should do. And should I do this or should I do that? And who should I collaborate with? That's work. And when I was younger, I remember thinking, what the fuck do you what do managers even do? Like, well, we don't need managers. We had this idea. We don't need managers. And it's because I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't get that management is work. And if you remove the managers, what happens is not the official managers. What happens is that not that, that work goes away, but that that work gets done in implicit, secret, illegible ways that are more, less fair instead of in straightforward ways that are like where someone's directly exercising power. And I think that the capitalist system, like money, people like being able to own things and property rights, and that's all doing in this it's like a big distributed computation. The capitalist system is a big distributed computation that's figuring out the answer to the question, how, how much of what stuff should every person be doing? which is a really hard, very important and very, very hard question. And every time you introduce a regulation, every time you introduce a regulation, every time you introduce a new tax, every time you do that, you like, you run the risk. In fact, you almost necessarily distort the system to some degree. And that's not necessarily bad. Like there's lots of regulation I support. That I think it's very important and good, but that's a real cost and a real risk. And doing it well is very hard. And most proposed reforms if you're not careful, the cure is worse than the disease. Like I, I think of this every time I think about Cal, like San Francisco housing policy. 
that there's a there's a children's song that comes to mind for me. I know an old lady who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. And you know, the song is about you have this problem, and so you eat the spider, and so you the spider is bad, so you go and you eat the the bird, and then you get the cat, and like eventually you eat the horse, and the horse kills you, and like. You introduce one thing that makes it harder to build new housing. So then you introduce this other thing to try to like generate more of it. But then that has these other effects. You introduce another thing and, and you end up with this stacked set of problems. And I feel like that happens with commonly when tinkering with the system, if you're not very, very cautious. So I'm, I guess I'm like, I'm in favor of reducing inequality. Like I think that we should thoughtfully try to figure out how to do that in a way that is a net benefit for society. But that doesn't mean that all policies that reduce inequality are good. Like, I think that's like, we must do something. This is something. Therefore, we must do it. Like, I feel I get that vibe a lot about like, this is a big, it's true. We have this problem. Like, our society should be more equal. Like, the the rampant inequality in our society is dangerous and bad. I ag agreed. Uh, this is a way to go fight against that. We have to go do it. No, 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 no. It has like there are other bad things too. Like the world is complicated. There's lots of stuff going on. You have to care about, like you have to care about the big picture. And it's get it, I don't know. It's there aren't easy there aren't easy answers. It's I guess that's like the the part of me that like I feel like I when I was a, when I was younger politically I wanted to believe there was like a system. I could just come up with this one system. Like like the the communist system is one of them, or like the libertarian hyper capitalist system is one. We have to have this abstract perfect system, and then we'll just use that, and we'll just follow those that and then it'll just work. And the more I've been like spent time actually having to run an organization like Twitch um, and I'm just observing the world around me, I've realized that is that is a fantasy. Like that is that is the fantasy. It's the fantasy that leads people to these horrible horrible conclusions. And it really has generated horrible outcomes when people try to do this. And like the real world is messy, complicated, nebulous like it doesn't have sharp boundaries and edges. Your and your clever, perfect, simple system. Where why don't we just that is not going to work. And I think that's those are the most the maybe the foremost dangerous words in politics. Why don't we just because wow. <laughs> like they're about to say something. It sounds good in theory, but in practice is going to be horrible. Like well, why don't we just take all the billionaires' money and give it to the, like it's like it, okay, like I understand it sounds good, but or you know why don't why don't we just, you know, ban all of the, you know, ban the, all the drugs? There's a really good one. Why don't we just ban all the drugs? I was like, well, the problem is that just is doing a lot of work because you can't just ban all the drugs. You also have to then build up a big police force, and actually, it's going to have all these other consequences and this thing and that thing. And by the time you're done paying for the consequences, you you're in prohibition, and you've generated or this massive wave of organized crime. And like, it, why don't we just ban alcohol? Well, yeah, but maybe we shouldn't just ban it. Like that's not, it's not that simple. And I think that like, it's just not that simple. It's just not that simple. Like, okay. So, so, so what about running? I mean, I'm kind of running this experiment now where you have a society that is run by technocrats, right? Which is China, mm -hmm. as opposed to a society that's run by politicians in America, where um, in America, it's very easy. Well, this might be an oversimplification and I might be falling victim to the same thought pattern here, but it seems like it's easy to latch onto simple ideas because they can be communicated in a broadcast medium very easily to a, you know, your popular, to your support base who then votes for you, right? So mm -hmm. this feedback cycle that supports oversimplification of ideas in our democracy. And in China, we have, there's a technocratic society that's like run by, I guess they're not elected administrators, right? Who are often from more of a functional background. And some people might say, I think there's a lot of people on in the American elite actually who are looking at that and being like, especially with, you know, Donald Trump being president of America right now, and looking at it and being like, Oh wow, that's pretty there's there's something appealing about that. Mm hmm I mean, I think the the thing people miss about democracy is that the goal is not to select the most competent possible leaders. And you know this in your heart because when you were in school and 
you if you wanted to like get the most competent possible leader for a, a problem, you you wouldn't have held a popularity contest. That would not have gotten you the most like competent possible leader. The the goal for democracy, in my opinion, like the thing that I think is really great about democracy, is to allow for an alternative mode of resistance to the government other than bloody violent revolution. Because if you have a dictatorship, no matter how competently run, no matter how well run, and you have someone who disagrees, who doesn't like what the dictatorship is doing, they really only have one choice, which is to attempt to stage a coup. And in a democracy, they just go run for the opposition party. And even if the, they're very unlikely to win, and even if they do win, they're very unlikely to make systemic change, the fantasy is at least there. And sometimes it actually does work. Every now and then it does work. And actually your chances of winning in an opposition election – is a lot more than your chances of successfully staging a coup. And if you fail in the election, nothing bad happens to you. And you fail in the coup, you and your family get murdered. So like, you'd really prefer to like go be part of the opposition party. It's really a much better deal for you. But in the dictatorship, you don't have that option. So if you really hate the current government, you really think that they need to be removed, you'll eventually, some number of people go and try to stage a bloody revolution. And there are other people around whose only opportunity to oppose the government is to join them. And eventually, somebody wins. Historically, it doesn't take that long. Non-democracies don't have a great track record of like continuous peaceful transitions of power. Like Three generations of a dynasty would be very, very good. Most of them don't last that long. And so the thing that's missed there is the question of like the fragility versus the efficiency, right? And like, I don't know. I think that maybe the Chinese system is more efficient right now. Maybe it's not. I'm not like an expert on it. But you're not running a government for the next 50 years. You're running a government ideally indefinitely because violent revolution is horrible. And the last, like the ultimate duty of a government is to avoid war, particularly war on your soil, but yeah. generally war. Like that's the goal is to avoid war as much as possible. And if you have a war, to win. And that's the first and last duty of a government. And Everything else happens after you've successfully avoided that. Because if you, if you have war internally to your country or externally, all your other goals will fuck those goals. So you have to solve the goal. Which other goals aren't important. You just if there's a civil war in your country, you're definitely not going to accomplish whatever equality, you know, economic growth, technological growth goals you have. And so I just think that it's very risky. I think it's very very risky to run a system without the safety valve of like an opposition party. And to the degree that you manage to take your, you know, dictatorship and and give people that outlet, create a a competitive technocracy where your coalition can like upend the other technocratic co coalition. Well, congratulations, you've just reinvented democracy. Like maybe with a better, better, more better run elections or something, but like ultimately you've just reinvented democracy. And okay, cool, great, like good job. I I, I applaud that. I think that's that you're. Most countries will either in the end figure out how to reinvent democracy in one way or another and re-implement it explicitly or implicitly, or those governments will fall and be replaced by another government, and eventually they'll figure it out or they won't. But like, it's not going to be a good time for the people in the country. And so I'm very pro-democracy as a result of it. Like this, and it's funny because when I was a kid, my idea was I just accepted the, like, the known statement in America, democracy is good. And... And I got older and I was like, wait a second, I had the same realization. Like, I don't organize anything else in my life as a democracy. Like, I don't find that when we run, when we go have a trip together as my, our, our friends, we're organizing a trip, that it's better if we vote on things. Like, voting on things is a terrible way to organize things. Why do we have democracy? What's going on with this? And yet I couldn't deny the fact that the democracy seems to be doing pretty well if you zoomed out. On the sweep of history, the democracy seems to be doing pretty well. So I had to think about it for a long time. It's like comes my the sort of understanding of like why I actually like, in an intellectually rigorous way why I think it works more than just like well the empirical evidence seems to support it, and that's right. Yeah, that's where I wound up now. I'm really happy too. I, I was worried for a while there when I was like a teenager that like I was going to realize like democracy was terrible and like actually we should become a dictatorship because uh, like maybe but then I realized that it wasn't. So it was a good thing. Okay, I want to pivot back to you and our personal conversation. Yeah. So what what's the most 
difficult thing that you've had to do in the last six years since since selling the company to Amazon? Uh, I think the hardest thing was realize a change from being a frontline leader to a to a rear line leader. Like I got Twitch where it was by having my hands on the product, talking to the customers, setting direction, articulating the vision, articulating goals, pushing, 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 like and leading from the front, leading like we're gonna go here, I'm gonna lead this way, lead the way, let's go. And that had a bunch of positive attributes, but it doesn't leave much room for the leaders underneath me to do that. It doesn't leave much a lot of room for other people to be part of the equation. And learning to step back and to disagree with leaders under me, think they're making a wrong decision that will be worse for our streamers and our viewers, and accepting that overriding them is still worse because it disempowers them and disenfranchises them was has been very hard. Because every like every everything I was trained in for the first, I don't know, eight years of startups was take responsibility, make sure the right call happens. But like the only way I got any good at this is by making a lot of mistakes. And like if I deny my team the chance to make those same mistakes, uh, we fail. And this is definitely one of those ongoing areas of work. I'm sure anyone at Twitch who listens to this will be like, yeah, you still don't do that. I, I, I'm, I'm aware. But I do it a lot more than I used to, whether people realize it or not. And uh, I think it's a very difficult lesson for a lot of leaders to learn. And I think it... You, there's still room for leading from the front as a as a CEO, and on you pick your issues. You pick the thing that like you feel very strongly about. It's very important. The one new product you're launching, the one new, you know, the one principled stand on this, you know, moderation philosophy you want to you want to push forward, or how the community is organized. But like generally, you need to let other people own it. And if they consistently make mistakes, maybe you have to replace them. But like at some level, you can't just always be stepping in. And that's been really hard for me because it's it's just, I don't know, it's just so painful at my company to watch people do something that I think is a mistake. Although I will note, they're right and I'm wrong some fair percentage of the time. Like, it's not that I'm always, right. sometimes it turns out that I thought they were making a mistake and I bit my tongue and they told them, go, okay, go for it. And then it turned out they were right. Uh, and that's that's been reassuring. Yeah, one of the things that's been hardest for me has been shifting from the reactive mindset to the curious mindset. So, you know, I think, I think, you know, we worked together for a long time and oftentimes in the past, I'd, if someone presented an idea that I thought was dumb, I'd be like, that's a fucking dumb idea. And here's how we should do it, right? This is the right way. Let me tell you the right way to do it. And I found people, well, they're a lot more powered, but also I learn a lot more. And I think I have a more interesting conversation when I approach things with the curious mindset. Like, why do they think that's going to work? Like, why is that? Why might it work? Right. You know, what, what can I learn from this rather than like the immediately reactive one? Yeah. But it was like very hard to like untrain myself, you know, because I, I feel like oftentimes with, you know, it, it fall, when you hear an idea that you don't think is going to work and that's tied to something that you care about, yeah. like the company being successful or whatever project that you're working on being successful, it triggers your you know, fight or flight instincts, you know, and you're like, oh, I got to do something or you, you get angry or anxiety because you're worried that it's not going to work. And then you're, you know, it's easy to get swept along into the, like, I need to like control this situation and make the outcome what I think is best yeah. immediately. Yeah. The, uh, the curious mindset's a really good way to put it. Uh, we call it at Twitch, we call it listening to learn, but I think it's, you know, the same, same core idea. Uh, I also think one of the hardest things that I've had to deal with over the last six years is Twitch getting too big for me to be able to have a trust relationship with everyone in the company and having to run a company where there are people inside the company who who don't know me, who don't know me as a person, who can't know me as a person because there's too many of them now. And so who I, I don't have a starting point of trust with. Uh, I'm learning how to lead uh, and earn that trust, but realize that actually, to some degree, I'll never earn that trust at the same level I could have it with someone who knew me as an individual, and that uh, that I have to lead differently 
uh, because they don't have context and they're not gonna they're not gonna give me the benefit of the doubt because they don't have enough context to give that benefit of the doubt. I don't give that benefit of the doubt to people sometimes when when I don't have that context. And that's just how that's just how leadership becomes as the, as organizations get bigger. People have their own assumptions, and if I could sit down with them and talk th through with them, I actually think we probably would agree, and they would they would understand they would they would have the full picture and why I came to the and even if they didn't agree they they didn't understand why I was making a decision from a place of integrity that made sense, but instead they don't have all that context that I can't give it to them I can't sit down and answer every single person's questions, and. It looks like I'm making this decision arbitrarily, or I'm defending a decision somebody else made for no good reason, because you I can't communicate the full the full picture. Um, that's been really hard because I want to like I have a real desire to like have everyone get it and and understand everything. Is there a way to? I mean, part of that is built by time spent with people, right? Like in the early days of a startup, when you're like 100 people or 10 people, mm -hmm. especially, but then. 50 or hundred or even 200 people, you're spending time with people, right? They're, they see you in meetings. You're like, they can see you explain your reasoning. I wonder if there are ways to emulate that, you know, like Bridgewater, right? They record every meeting and anyone can watch any meeting. Yeah. Like now they've probably, it goes back to our regulation conversation where that can lead to probably all sorts yeah. of downstream consequences. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I wonder like, one thing that comes to mind is like, maybe you should make a loom video for every important decision where you just explain like, here's like why I'm, this is what's the decision yeah. here, you know? I think that's a, there's definitely something there. Like I, I for sure think we underinvest in internal communications as we've gotten bigger. Like we yeah. invest a lot and it's still just nowhere near enough. Like we're still behind the amount we should do. And at some level, the reason you have hierarchy inside of a company is everyone can't understand everything that's happening. Like I spend 50 hours a week working and probably 40 of those hours is like listening to other people and assimilating information about what's going on in their area and asking questions to build my mental map of like what's happening at a broad level across the board in the entire company. We can't afford to have everybody do that. Like you can only really, you only have a few people who are doing that as their job because most people need to be doing an actual job like getting work <laughs> yeah. done and they don't have yeah. time to like listen to videos on every decision they just have to kind of take it, it on at faith. some level everyone's gonna take it on they have to take it on faith which is why i think i think it's a trust issue they like, do people trust that the leadership is made for all these unaudited decisions that they can't possibly audit because even if i gave them all of the data they didn't have time do they trust it was being it was made in a sensible way or at least that we tried to make it a sensible way and like we'll do better next time if it, if it wasn't actually i would bring back go back to the video then or yeah. like the recorded meetings or whatever, because I think part of what that does is build trust right. because it's like, you can't, uh, the point of an audit is not that I am looking at every line in the finances. It's like, I'm looking at these five lines and they're right. So that I believe that you are making, you know, sound, you're doing these, the, the books correctly in, you know, across. That's why we do an, an open Q and A, anonymous Q and A every week with the company for exactly that reason, because it effectively acts as a, as a, as an audit by the, people at the company on leadership. I think it's actually really valuable for that reason. But the problem is the auditor needs to have enough context to understand when you try to explain it to them, whether the decision was good or not. And some of these decisions are very complicated and require you to understand quite a bit of context before you get to the answer. And we don't have the ability to get everyone there. Now, I think there's something to the idea of like, where well, the company is going to pick areas a deep dive for us to explain and we're like we're going to run it like an audit and you don't get to pick your own unique area but you get to vote on which areas get picked and then we're going to deep dive those that could be that could you know i agree that could help build trust but there's a different kind of trust between trust built in a person you don't know personally and trust built in someone that you have a personal relationship with and in the beginning everyone in the company has a personal relationship with me as we got bigger, even if everyone in the company doesn't have a personal relationship with me, everyone had a personal relationship with someone who had a personal relationship with me. And now we have lots of people who like don't know anyone who knows me and may not know anyone who knows anyone who knows me personally. Like they might have sitting in a meeting with me, but like, you know, twice a year and like they don't really have a relationship. And that's uh that's that's just different. 
like it used to be that I could, I could lead on this through a level of like sort of personal connection and that goes away. And that's been, that's been hard because because I want, I want that. I like that. I like that feeling of being in a community, but communities change when they get beyond a certain size, like pretty, pretty significantly and important. Yeah. So that's been, that's been a real struggle for just like, I guess for me emotionally at work more than anything else. Like, I don't know how much it's impacted my ability to like get my job done, but it's been like very difficult for me emotionally because I often feel like sad and like disconnected because I'm, I'm not able to communicate with the people who, uh, you know, rely on my decisions the way I'd like to. What's been the most challenging internal issue where there has been that disconnect? Um, you know, it changes from month to month, but it's often around issues that are deeply emotional to people. So things like safety, trust and safety decisions, headcount allocation decisions, compensation, diversity issues, like things that like really impact people very deeply and in very important ways that they have a strong emotional reaction to. Because that's the place where the lack of the personal connection really hurts you. Like if it's just if it's an injury, if you're interested in something kind of intellectually that you think it's like important intellectually for the company, you'll accept someone's intellectual explanation who you don't really know that seems to make sense explaining it. But if you care about an issue really viscerally and deeply, even if their explanation kind of sounds good, if you don't trust them personally, if you don't have that connection with them personally, and they're telling you something you don't want to hear it can be really hard to trust that it came from a, a genuine place. It's interesting because, I mean, this isn't just your problem. This is playing out all over Silicon Valley, Absolutely. right? And I think Silicon Valley, particularly as opposed to traditional industry companies, because right now there's kind of a big target on Silicon Valley's back and a lot of media and then politicians are looking for, you know, people to hold accountable for a lot of the change that's happened in the world that maybe they don't like. So, you know, a lot of friends of ours, we'll go unnamed, have gone through situations where they get pilloried in the in the press and on Twitter and, you know, for taking one or the other side of some issue and their employees kind of latch on to that external mm -hmm. narrative in, you know, in, instead of the internal narrative that they try to present, you know, here's like our reasons for doing this, you know, and it creates this very bifurcated and uncomfortable and disconnected yeah. feeling internally. And, and, you know, for the, it can definitely happen as, as well, big obvious political issues, but I think compensation is an example of one where I don't think there's particularly a strong narrative around like tech compensation for tech employees, but it's very visually important to people. And so it, it happens anyway, but I do think that's, that's a common place where it happens. I actually feel real, I feel, have a lot of feelings for politicians. I think politicians get caught in this constantly. Like they're trying to, I think a lot of politicians are trying to do the right thing, trying to pass laws that like are going to be good. They have limited power. They can't just wave a magic wand and do whatever they want. Grandstanding and like being like taking the perfectly moral position yourself may feel good and make, you know, online internet warriors happy, but rarely like actually get shit done, rarely actually gets legislation passed. And I think there's a lot of politicians out there. There are politicians out there who just are just playing to their base and like being very loud. But I think there's also a lot of politicians out there who are trying to do the right thing and who are getting dragged for it. And I feel for them because they, they, how do they build that trust? They're going to, I think it's bad with 2000 people or however many at Twitch, like approximately, they've got a million people constituents or something. They're in a, they're no matter what they do, they can't build that personal trust and therefore they'll never get the benefit of the doubt. And like, that's got to suck. It's got to suck the most when you know you're trying to do the right thing. <laughs> like if you know that you're just kind of fucking like playing people to like advance your political goals, then fine. Like maybe it doesn't hurt that bad, but if you know you're trying to do the right thing and people like are pissed at you anyway, that's got to, and I, you know, I, I got to believe our, some, not probably not every policy, but I think a lot of people, I don't think you go into politics because you don't want to do a good job at it. I think most people go in and would like to change the world and like for it, make the world better. And that then it's when you're in there, it's really freaking hard to do it. 
but like, I think they're there for, you know, mostly for good reasons. Right. Um, okay. So what is the future of Twitch? I think Twitch has definitively created the best way for you to stream yourself, you know, playing video games or really anything else for, you know, many hours a week uh, and like earn a living from like live streaming as this like part-time, full-time job thing. Like that is the thing we've nailed above and beyond anything else. We do a lot of other good stuff. We've really nailed that. And we've nailed the ability for those people to create communities. I think that's awesome. Like I think one of the most important things we do is enable streamers to build communities around themselves. Like we don't actually build the community that the streamers do, but we've built software that's enabled some really cool communities. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. Um, I think the future for Twitch is uh, simplifying that so that more people can can do it. Right now, it's like pretty hard to become a streamer. It's pretty hard to become a successful streamer. You have to grind a lot. You have to stream a lot of hours per week. And I think our future is is lowering those barriers to entry. I think that one of the things that will do is help Twitch expand outside of gaming. I think you'll see a lot more non-gaming content as we succeed at that. Because while it's easy to play a video game for 40 hours a week, it's hard to sing for 40 hours a week. It's hard to, you know, cook for 40 hours a week. Because like it's just a lot of food to cook. But it's easy to play a video game for 40 hours a week, which is why I think streaming has worked so much better for video games than it has for a lot of other content types. Yeah, it's interesting. That's it's like gaming, like when we started, you know, we were general mm -hmm. purpose site for everything, and there were a lot of competitors like Ustream and Livestream. And there were a lot, there was like a diaspora of yep. content. You know, people were trying to do everything from talk radio to like cooking and like a lot of like just just right. for fun just or what do, they, what do you call it? The like just yeah. talking on a camera, just chatting streams. And that didn't really work, probably because of what you've said, which is that you know, it was too much like to, to build an audience in the way that you, you know, the Twitch streamers, like gaming streamers build an audience, you have to just be on for all a lot of time. And it's just like streaming a game provides like some sort of context for being on for like eight hours a day, right? Like you could actually just play this fucking game like for over and over and over yeah. again. And it's fun. It's, actually, it's fun day. to play video games. That's the whole and, point. It's like not torture yeah, to play a video game for yeah, eight yeah. hours. Um, they're designed to be fun. And so I think that's the big, I think there's this, this, I've come to believe there's this big thing tied together between figuring out how to make live streaming work if you do it for an hour a week instead of 40 hours a week or 20 hours a week and expanding more beyond gaming. We have some real success in music because it turns out there's a lot of musicians who actually like love playing music. And if you do not take enough breaks between songs, you actually can do it for 20 to 40 hours a week. But that's like the exception rather than the rule. And most musicians, that's like very hard. It's like a very, it's a big ask. It's a bigger ask for a musician yeah. than it is for a gamer. Um, and so I think it's going to be helpful for music, even though music is working. Um, and I think it's going to be very helpful for like things like cooking or extreme sports. Like you're not hang gliding for 40 hours a week. You can try. That would be real, real hard. I'd love to see a cooking show. Does anyone do cooking for 40 hours? I'd love to see a cooking show where just someone just keeps making food just like, <laughs> all fucking day like that would be like pretty amazing actually they just cook like on demand whatever you request and have like a just and start up you know start fridge i feel like that would be fun i think it would be exhausting and like no one would actually be able to sustain it but i think it'd be fun but getting back to our startup back in the early days of justin tv so when we added in michael and kyle and we we changed the kind of founder dynamic and we started our new company, Justin TV, which was us trying to create our own live reality show. It was kind of still a time where we were not really building for any specific user. We were just kind of building whatever we thought was, was um, yeah. interesting, but what changed about it? Oh, I, I figured out what changed about it. Like I have a whole theory about what changed for us. Uh, we went from building for an imagined third party that we didn't actually talk to, to building for ourselves. We were building the software that we wished existed to produce the live reality television show of our dreams. Now, it turns out that we were crap at the producing a live reality television show part, but it didn't matter because as a customer, we weren't that different from the other people who wanted to build live reality television shows. And it turned out that like 
people wanting to stream live on the internet was like a thing. That was actually a pretty popular thing. And by building for ourselves, trying to earnestly and actually do the show, we figured out stuff that we wanted. And because we were the customer, we didn't have to talk to anyone else. We were just building stuff that we wanted. And actually, that was a, that was a very productive way to run Justin TV for the first six months, which was since we were producing the show, we didn't have to talk to streamers. We just like were the streamer. And if we needed a feature, we'd go build it for ourselves. I think what if I could diagnose something that I think went wrong with Justin TV, it was when we turned the show off, but didn't in a disciplined way switch to we'd learn the wrong lesson. We'd learn like, oh, we can just intuitively invent products and like it'll work great. And like, yes, if you're the customer. Yeah. But in reality, we were not the customer anymore because we'd stopped making the show. And so we were just guessing what people might want instead of like having a real direct line to it. And I think that that's a, uh, that's a classic thing that goes wrong with startups is like the people are neither building for themselves nor for a specific concrete other person they can talk to. They're just kind of making stuff up in their head. And you really need to be in one of the two. Like I've almost never seen someone build a product for an imagined third party that, that succeeds. Now, there are products like, uh, it was a good example of this, like Amazon or Google, like products that truly get used by every human being on earth at some level are different because you are by definition the customer and you're always the customer. Everyone needs to buy crap online. Everyone needs to like search for stuff. And so you never, you, those companies never have to go through this phase almost of like figuring out how to do customer development in the same way because their product was intrinsically like good to start with. Whereas like, I feel like a lot of companies are building something more narrow than that. Like not every product goes to every single human being on earth. Most, most products in fact do not. And for those companies, you either need to be building for yourself or for, for someone else. I guess I'd say in that case, from that point of view, really Google and Amazon are building for themselves. They just, they're of course the customer because everyone's the customer. Right. And I guess we spent this long period of time where we we had built something that was this platform for anyone or for broadcasters to, to stream. And then we stopped being a broadcaster ourselves. So we kind of like lost touch with what they wanted and kind of existed in that state for quite a long time, actually. Basically like three years probably of, of existing in that state. Well, I would I would break it down into like a I think of Justin TV as kind of being like this multi-phase evolution. There's the beginning part where we're building for ourselves. Then there's this part where we are just trying to stop the site from melting down because the thing we built for ourselves is so popular that we can't handle the demand because we're basically not actually that good of software engineers yet and have not actually built out for the and and to be fair to us, AWS was new and barely existed at the time. We were a very early adopter of AWS on my personal account, actually. And as a result, it was really hard to scale up like a live video service or whatever, because there wasn't there wasn't the ability to just turn on servers at the push of a button. Like you had to go put stuff in data center. It was complicated. And it was not something that you could do overnight. And it was a pretty hard task that was definitely beyond our technical skills. And then there's the phase after that where I feel like we do spend about a year, maybe a year and a half, kind of floundering, trying to invent things that will products that will drive product product progress, but without actually talking to customers. Um, that's the era of like challenges and a lot of like front page redesigns and just like attempts to do stuff based on, we looked at data. We didn't not look at data. We looked at like the Google analytics data and like our log data and tried to figure out what would work, but we didn't really like in a systematic way, go talk to any customers. And then there's a the period where we're like, oh, we have to make money. And then we go enter into the money-making phase, which was actually quite successful because we were the customer, which is the customer is the investor who wants money. And we just were just straight up trying to monetize. And that we were actually very good at. That was like very successful and like totally worked because we had a very clear goal and we could optimize against it very directly. I only really think we were failing for maybe 24 months, 18 to 24 months in the middle when we were neither building for ourselves, scaling, nor making money. When we had to try to invent product to drive growth. Yeah, that's a very succinct summary of what we went through. And so eventually we we did, you know, we kind of were making money. I remember we were, like there was a point in time where we were like, oh shit, we're not gonna be able to raise any more money because I mean, the recession had happened. 
it was 2008 and then video was not popular at the time. Everyone was like the video, you know, video ads will never pay for video delivery. And so, you know, the, the Silicon Valley story was like, okay, we'll get out of there. We're going to raise more money. And then we, we grow the site and then we get another round and we raise more money after that. And at a certain point we were like, we were pretty smart. I think we, we were like, Oh, this is not going to happen for us again. Like right. it was after our series a, you know, we got a series A extension, right? Series A one or whatever mm -hmm. from our existing investors. And we're like, Which that I, was super hard. This I just want to take a moment again. and express, express a moment of gratitude for our investors. Like we raised money from all software partners, from Stuart Allsop specifically. And while I think we didn't always get along with Stuart and it was sometimes hard, like board meetings were hard, whatever we had like issues. When we needed money, he was there for us and backed us again, despite like the fact he, he could have not done that. Like he had, he had a relatively small fund and decided to double down on us. And I think, you know, we were probably one of the better companies for full. I'm sure it was like a calculated decision, but it was also like, uh, it's what I, it's what everyone I think really at the end of the day wants from a VC who backs in series A is like, we failed to raise money from outside and he backed us anyway. That not every, that doesn't happen for a lot of companies. A lot of companies fail to raise money from the outside and then their insiders don't back them and then they die. And there's a, there's a bunch of potential worlds where that happened to Justin TV. And I'm, I'm all, to this day very grateful for the fact that that didn't happen to us and that Stuart decided to back us again. I'm sure he's grateful too. It was like, it didn't, not like it didn't work out for him, but, uh, but I'm very grateful for that. I think it was, a uh, that's one of those things that like is a, we got a bunch of lucky breaks along the way. And that was one of those lucky breaks was being able to raise an inside round right before 2008 crash, even though we failed to raise an outside round. Like that's a, that was a lucky moment for us. For sure. And uh that's a good call out because he does deserves props for that he also got he got paid for it but he oh, yeah uh, totally he deserves props for that and it, it makes up for the time that he took us to that investor dinner that uh we ended up paying for where he brought his date who was telling us all about ayahuasca and throwing up and, and how it was a good kind of vomit not the bad kind yeah no, the, where he was true was sometimes hard but it was also like it's also good because like you know, the other thing Stuart did for me that I thought was amazing when I, when I shifted from being uh, CTO of Justin TV to CEO of Twitch is uh, he sat me down and he asked me like, Emmett, what makes you think you can be the CEO? Like, what do you, what makes you think you like, you're ready to do this? And I, I told him honestly, like, you know, I don't know, but I think we're both going to find out. And he was like, yes, okay, that, actually, I like that. That's, you're right. You don't know. I'm, and he was like, I really think you'd benefit from getting a coach. And he introduced me to my coach, Yossi. I still use Yossi today. And that was, that was Stuart making sure I had someone in my corner to like, help me learn how to be a better CEO. And Yossi's helped me a ton over the years. And I think, you know, I, who knows what would have happened if I hadn't gotten that. But I, I certainly think it's been uh, helpful and is part of the Twitch success story. Um, and so I actually think it's interesting with, with VCs. You have a bunch of moments as a VC and with the investors you work with that are the day-to-day -day moments. I think it's particularly true for like investors. And those sometimes people annoy you or they don't annoy you or like it's easy to work with them or it's hard to work with them. And then there's the moments that really count where like you really need someone to have your back, or they, you know, there's a moment that like there's a big change happening and someone needs to step up and be part of that in some way. And uh I don't know, I've always felt sort of really at least showed up for me in those moments as like in my corner. Uh, I've been grateful for that. I think that's like been a, that's also been a lucky thing. Yes, for sure. I mean, many, many investors, you know, I've been on, on, on a lot of boards and seen companies from the inside and that doesn't always happen. And the really yeah. great investors do, you know, double down and kind of help you through those, those tough times. Um, well, let's talk more about, about leveling up and your journey yeah. leveling up. Cause I've kind of covered in the past, you know, pivoting to Twitch and, yeah, as I, I'm always internally grateful to you because you know <laughs> it was your you were the impetus for it. You were the primary product driver and really turned our kind of moderately okay but unsustainable company into obviously this legendary outcome. And so, you know, what are the ways that you, as you became CEO, what what were the ways that you leveled up as a, and what are the lessons learned? It's a good, it's a good question. I've also I've also told that story a bunch of times, and I think that's a good. It's a good different way to ask about it because I haven't. Uh, I'm almost like bored of telling the like the core story at this point. Yeah. You know, you get asked it a lot. Uh, the first thing was, I think, 
becoming CEO forced me to realize like I have to be responsible. Like ultimately, like the decision has to be mine. I have to like make some hard calls that people are going to disagree with and be okay with the impact. And like some people left when I made like I changed how we did our coding culture and stuff. But I think about that responsibility landing on me made me feel much more comfortable. Like, oh, I I have to make some of these hard calls. And so like I instituted a culture of like code review. Like your code has to go through code review before it gets goes out. And like that sounds silly now, like that, like that we had programmers who just didn't like that. They didn't like having to have their code go through code review before it went out. And it was like, well, like that's the kind of company we are now. So what what are you gonna do? And I really like that I really I think got a lot out of the just the just sort of almost like the officially being told like you have to make the call now. Um, I think I think there's a great know. call out there because you know we've known each other for a long time and kind of seen each other through all all these phases of life. And I remember before you became CEO, you know, we had this. I guess it's not whatever the four person version of a triumvirate is, right? Like yeah. a quadumvirate of like the yeah. four founders who would co make all the decisions, and oftentimes it was this brutal war of attrition on who would like be the last man standing on how they wanted something to go. And I remember seeing you be like, oftentimes be like, just like, well, I guess they really care. So it could be like, however, Justin wants it, or right. Michael wants it or whatever. And just kind of like you would lose the war of attrition. I mean, I think some of the time you won when it was, you know, something that was really right. important to you. But when there's like one throat to choke, or, you know, like yeah. one person's in charge, it is a different organization. Like there's something fundamental about human organization that like when you are in charge and it's your responsibility, it really forces you to think about things in a different way and like really continuously be on the line for the results that I think we did not understand like for years. Yeah. There's a totally different feeling and mindset and like a really important one. And like, I, I, uh, uh, I think that was a big part of it. The other thing I did was I just sort of decided becoming a good manager no longer seemed optional to me. It always seemed like, well, maybe I can just like, maybe being a manager doesn't have to be a thing I have to be good at. Maybe I'll just be good, you know, contribute to this company as a programmer and this other way as an individual contributor. And then it became obvious when I was CEO, like, I, I have to be a good manager, or at least I have to be an okay man. I have to like, learn how to do this. And I guess I treated that as like a skill set I had to learn instead of as like a, a way you either were or you weren't. I think that was a, a much healthier relationship with becoming a manager. I think it was related to becoming CEO in the sense that it crystallized for me that I had to learn it. But uh, the thing I think is transferable maybe to other people is that management turned out to be a large collection of learnable skills, not a like mysterious, like you're, some people are just good managers or good leaders. It's like, it's all something can be broken down into like steps and, and techniques and things you practice doing. And I did a lot of reading, actually. I remember right around this time, I was going back, going back through my Kindle and I have all these books at that time. I was like, I was reading a lot of self-help and I was, I was reading a lot of books about like career development and growth. Uh, I think that was really impactful for me. Um, I read like what got you here won't get you there. And like uh, the Andy Grove book, High Output Management, uh, and like a bunch of books about being a good manager. Because it, I was like, I guess I have to learn about this. And I guess my way of engaging with material when I really feel like it's very important for me to understand something is to just go read a lot. And I thought, I don't know if I found that very helpful. And I got a lot of feedback like, yeah, it worked. Like you are a totally different person at work. Um, I think I was a much more pleasant person at work, actually post becoming a manager, I think I was like very difficult to deal with as an individual contributor because I was in my head all the time and annoyed at people for interrupting me programming or annoyed at people for calling me out for not programming. But either way, annoyed at other people around <laughs> me instead of like considering my impact on them and like how I could be a leader. What were some of the biggest management mistakes that you made as when you became CEO of Twitch? Um, I'd say the the number one mistake was not setting up Amazon calls them mechanisms, but I think other companies generally call them processes, but it's a specific like style of, of, uh, of process. I didn't understand how process worked because we were anti-process. We were anti-process and anti-manager because we'd come from this cult of the startup. That's like process and managers are bad and like bad process and bad managers are bad. Good process and good managers are the only way anything ever gets done. And I tried to empower people by just being like, just go figure out what to do and just do whatever. 
but that actually doesn't that doesn't actually empower people. It creates a vacuum of of understanding of like of goals and people don't understand like if how to judge whether their own behavior is good and they don't understand how to prioritize in the bigger picture. I think what was good about what I did was I did trust people a lot. I gave people a lot of room uh, and a lot of trust and like how they approach things and how they solve problems. I think what was bad was I didn't provide them a framework for judging success. And so oftentimes the framework for success became whatever Emmett says is good. Like people just bring things to me, like, is this good? Is it good now? Am I doing good now? And I think that we're still actually to this day at, at Twitch dealing with the ramifications of me doing that poorly early uh, when I was the CEO. Because to this day, I think a lot of things at Twitch, decisions get made and people kind of want, they want Emmett to just sign off on it like directly because they aren't, they haven't built the internal confidence of like, I understand our values and our direction and our goals and I can personally judge this good. And I don't need someone else to tell me whether it's aligned or not. I think we've gotten a lot better at that over time, but like that was a that was a huge gap. Um, and I I think I was good at the goals part actually. I was okay to to, to nuance that. I set pretty good goals for the company every year. I set a set of goals like what we're going to accomplish this year, and those were pretty clear. And people, those were the very good rallying cries. Very like, I remember one of them was like Ash Top was like basically a set of like an acronym for like I actually don't even remember what the uh, uh, what the, what the <laughs> stands for anymore, but it's basically like we need to bring costs down for bandwidth. We need to like sign more streamers. We need to like increase revenue per hour and all that kind of stuff. And that was, uh, that was good. What people didn't have was a chance to learn. I think that's like the, there's this thing I've, that I've, uh, struggled with where I was like, because I was the lead product guy and I had like this vision of what I wanted. I would go around basically telling people, Oh, we're going to go do this thing with these goals. But then if someone did something I didn't like, I'd be like, oh, this, you did it wrong. Like if that was bad and like force them to correct it or like, and I was right a lot, but it didn't matter because it, it disempowered the people on the team. I think that was the biggest mistake I made early. I mean, I think I still make this mistake this day sometimes, but particularly early, it was very disempowering to people. I mean, it's a common problem for startups, right? I'm not excusing it. I'm just saying like, yeah. it's oftentimes the technology company well even non-technology company right the product co driven company is dr like the founder is the the kind of voice of the product and it really works when they're innovating and building and then as they scale it starts to break down because they're not able to transfer like that mental model or like that that magic to someone else right or or empower those people and so it's almost like the natural life cycle of a company in silicon valley to like hit that wall and then kind of like slowly fade into irrelevance after like that initial burst of product genius that came from like the founder or founders. Yeah. I think the, the key insight I had about this is I got farther. I'm, you know, again, still learning this every day. I'm sure people at Twitch would tell you, I screw this up now even is that like, how did I get to be able to be any good at this? We spent clearly like five years. We were just discussing kind of failing and like screwing a lot of stuff up. And it was those screw ups that like where I like learned, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, that doesn't work. Oh, that doesn't work. And that was what I needed to provide to the like product managers at Twitch, to the to the team at Twitch, which was that opportunity to fail. I'd say the other thing I screwed up as a CEO was not trusting my own hiring instincts enough. Um, I didn't spend nearly enough time on hiring and I I made a bunch of hiring mistakes earlier where we hired people who just weren't actually a good fit for what we needed to get done. Um, and when I look back at it, I actually went back through some of my old like interview votes and like who I thought was great at the interview, who I thought was okay. I actually had a pretty good sense. I did, I was not good at telling who was going to be good or who was going to be bad necessarily, but people who went on to be stars or like really good, I had a pretty good sense of like, oh, this person's going to be awesome. And I should have put more effort into finding more people where I felt that way. It wasn't that I, there are lots of people who I, I thought was not convinced were going to be awesome who then turned out to be great. But when I had that sense, this person was going to be great. It turned out to be fairly reliable. And so I think I could have done a big favor for Twitch. And this is, again, one of the lessons I'm still learning over time. If I had put more energy into hiring, more energy into finding people where I was like, this person's awesome. It's exactly who I need. They're going to be great. Because otherwise you're rolling the dice. And sometimes you find someone who's great. And sometimes you find someone who's okay. And and so you have to replace people, and like I could have, I could have held up for someone who I was really excited for. That would have been a, that would have been. A, I think I, I, I never put enough energy into that. And we were also chronically behind our hiring goals. We like, we're always like took too long to to hire people at all. Um, 
So what I want to talk about the acquisition. And one thing I want to talk about at the meta level was whether you think selling Twitch was the right move or not. Because today, you know, it looks like a tens of billions of dollars company, you know, relatively still independent. It wasn't, I think Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, Google looked a little bit different because there were resources that they specifically needed from those companies, like Facebook's growth team really helped Instagram, for example, grow to the thing it is. Whereas whereas Amazon, as far as I'm aware, you know, we've kind of talked over the years, maybe they provided capital and like maybe you some mentorship and, and central centralized resources, but not necessarily like some sort of magic algorithm that made Twitch like really accelerate, right? You continue to follow the mission that you laid out when we pivoted the company like nine years ago. So what do you think about that? So I've thought a lot about whether obviously selling Twitch to Amazon was the right move and it, should we have sold the company at all? And what was the, what was, was, was my reason at the time valid? And when I sold the company at the time, there were sort of two driving thoughts. One was, if I don't sell this, I'm going to have to be on a money raising treadmill for a while. Because at the time, Twitch was growing fast and we had not ramped monetization. And it was very clear that like we were going to have to raise a lot of money over the next few years. Like the trajectory of the business was losing a lot of money and competition was going to increase. Like we knew that we were going to get more competition uh, from Facebook, from Google, from you know, if we, whoever whatever company we didn't sell to, we were going to wind up competing with because everyone was going to want into the space. And so we were like having to consider like taking dilution and like taking more money, you know, raising more money. And I hate raising money. I personally like really just dislike the process of raising money. And it's funny, having sold Twitch, it's easy now for me to consider raising money. And now from where I am today, I could easily raise the money Twitch needed then. But Pre-selling Twitch, raising money was going to be not not by any means impossible, but like much harder because I didn't have a W under the belt that would prove that I could ra- that people should give me the money to raise. The interesting thing about that is I use this as an example all the time when I'm talking to people about how, like, people ask me all the time, Justin, if would the current Justin of today, like the more self-confident but like maybe like less extrinsically motivated Justin have been, been able to be as successful as, you know, like, did you need that extrinsic motivation and that drive to like show the world that you're something and like really ego driven motivation to like actually be, become successful? And I say, actually, I think I would have been much more successful if I wasn't ego driven because I, part of the reason I left, right. I moved into like a non-operational role. I was like, Emmett was the CEO and I wanted to be the CEO of something, right? Like I, it was really important for me to like go and build something where like I'm the man and like it all falls apart if it wasn't for me. And I think at Twitch, it was like your idea, your pivot and your baby. And I was like, oh, well, Emmett has got this. And so I should like go do something else. And I think I often say like, hey, you know, like my superpower is fundraising. I love fundraising. I think I'm very good at fundraising. And actually, if I was like not extrinsically motivated and more like, okay with whatever was happening, and I had just stuck around and helped raise money and just work for two weeks a year, been completely behind the <laughs> scenes. You be the CEO. All I do is raise money for, you know, whatever, two months a year, let's say. Yeah, yeah. That would have been probably a, a positive expected value outcome. Right. Yeah, probably. Because I was so ego driven at the time and I was like, oh, I want to so and I and I was very much like still in the chasing mode of like, I want new things. And like everything has to be new all the time. I want to start a new startup and I want to be the CEO and I want to like make a lot of, you know, it's going to be even bigger or whatever. There were a lot of like toxic extrinsic motivations that actually got in the way of success. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I think there's like, I think that was true for me too. Like the, the, the more mission driven I've gotten as I've gotten older, where I've, I've realized like, Oh, like, well, and I think it's, it's easy to realize that also when you have more material success, but I've realized like oh this the the mission is more is like much more of why I'm here and like that's actually the, the valuable part of what I'm doing. Uh, I've become a better leader actually, and I make better I make better decisions that are more productive for the company, not the other way around. Uh, the other reason I sold the company was on a risk adjusted basis. Uh, we took a lot of money off the table and. <laughs> Like I wanted the <laughs> money, like, and it, it got a lot of money and it was, it was, it meant, it meant not only for me, but for a bunch of my, 
uh, my co-founders, but also my, my friends at Twitch or at Justin TV, but worked there for a long time. Like I already got like liquidity. And I probably could have raised a round and done secondary for like the founders, but like that was life changing for a lot of people. And it was definitely something I was on my mind a lot of like, we're going to really get everybody uh, some amount of liquidity out of this transaction. And that's going to be like a good thing. And, and it's going to be, I'm going to have money. And my friends are going to have money. We're all going to be like, go do fun shit together. And it's going to be great. And I, I was honestly, I think part of it was also, I was a little burned out. It had been like, you know, 2000, five to 2014, like flat out sprinting basically. And I was with, you know, with some breaks, but like I hadn't really taken vacation ever. And I was like tired. And I think that feeling tired was one of the main reasons I wound up selling it. It's like, I can like take the, that comment, like we can take, I'm tired. This is like a, this like locks in a definite win. I'm super proud of. And like, I don't have to worry about it anymore. And I think being tired was a big was a big driver in it. In much of fact, I'm really glad we sold it to Amazon uh, because I think of all the tech companies, Amazon has the most like hands off, empower the CEO, like just let them be independent attitude, and that meant that I could I got the comfort and like the ability to sort of take some money off the table and like and relax a little bit and have a year or two where like I wasn't freaking out about like the company all the time. And then come back to it and still have it be an independent company and still get to run it. And that's been really rewarding. And I've actually gotten much more like re-energized on Twitch uh, over time or the, you know, since we sold it five years ago, six years ago, my energy level on Twitch actually is like recovered from feeling actually kind of tired around the time of acquisition to being much more engaged today. I want to call out a couple stories from, well, the first thing actually I'll say is, is you really did carry it home. And I mean, I've told you this before, but like, thank you, you know, really life changing outcome uh, for all of us. And what you said has actually played out where we've had to, we've gotten the opportunity of immense privilege to lead incredibly beautiful, constructive, like interesting lives, I guess before, but also subsequent, you know, with the liquidity you know, funded amazing companies, got to travel to amazing places and have amazing experiences. And it was all, you know, I, yeah. our, I mean, you really carry it home. And and uh, our friendship has been one of the most beautiful parts of my life. So thank you. But I'm the really other things I want, that. I'll, I'll tell you, yeah. uh, you know, you hear from me like at least once yeah. a year. So <laughs> the other things I want to call out was I remember having one call with uh, our board before we did the acquisition. I remember two calls during the acquisition. Actually, I'd love to tell two stories from the acquisition that I thought were really hilarious. Um, one was I remember getting on a board call to like approve the deal or we discussing some like very final points of the deal. And shout out to our board member, Chris Pike, who was at Thrive Capital. And he was yep. basically the only board member who actually like used the site, right? Like, or even yeah, really yeah. He, was a, he was a heavy it. Twitch user. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he was like, we were all talking about some detail. And I remember he was saying, he said like, Hey, I think we shouldn't sell. Yeah. And there was silence on this free conference call.com line, right? Yeah. Like it was just dead silence for like 30 seconds. And then one of the other board members, I won't even, I won't call him out. was just like, why? <laughs> and, and Chris was yeah. like, yeah. I think it could be worth more. And then there was another blank silence like just empty <laughs> pregnant silence and then he the other board member said like how much more and chris was like i don't know like three four billion i just think it could be worth more and then there was another long long silence and then we just continued talking about whatever we were talking about you I, I actually i also remember that moment and i really like appreciate chris saying that and chris to be fair chris was probably right um, it's one of those, you know, it's one of those things where I think we knew that. I mean, I, I knew that I knew that there was like, if we held on, there was a chance it would be worth a lot more. And I also knew that sometimes you hold on and it like, isn't worth a lot more. And in fact, you get diluted and like the issue was, I think for Twitch, and I think I, I, I don't, I don't know if, I think this is also part of selling. It was like, we'd taken a lot of dilution and like had everything stuff like, the economics are very split up over a very long, large number of people um, because of the history of the company. And 
I think that also makes it harder to make bolder financial decisions uh, because you have lots of people who have opinions and you have to sort of deal with all of the different uh, the constituencies. Yeah, I I think that 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 was true. Although I think I do think there was an inflection point. Well, I mean, it depends. Like counterfactual, it's like hard to hard to say, right? It's one hundred percent clear in retrospect that I'm sure we could have raised a round, and if we had raised a round at that point, I'm sure we could have continued to like scale Twitch, and like it is likely that we would have had a very good outcome. Like, like it's likely that. In retrospect, with everything you know now, with the benefit of hindsight, that it was not economically maximizing for shareholders that moment in time to, sh- to sell, uh, which is to say Amazon made a smart decision. Yeah. On the other hand, that's entirely with the benefit of hindsight. For sure. The other, the other story I remember was like, I remember calling you actually at some point over that summer that we were negotiating the deal. And I said, if you want to, you should keep going. Yeah. And I had... It's like one of those things is like, you, you trust, I should trust my instinct. I, I always like make these, to have these like instincts and I'm like, often don't ignore them. And then like, like, for example, like two years ago, I was like, man, I should put a seven figure bet into Bitcoin now. Like, because I, I just know it's going to go back to like, whatever people, this is human psychology. Right. And I actually funded the account in GDAX or Coinbase. Yeah. yeah. And then I would like, didn't do it. And I was, I mean, it doesn't, who cares? Like whatever, money, money, money is money. But like, I knew it was going to work and I just didn't do it. And I remember thinking, Emmett, it's like, we finally figured it out. Emmett is the right person at this time. And like, if like, I, you know, I'm a gambler at, at heart. So I'm like, just like, fuck it. We should just keep going if he wants to. But then I think those other factors that you just talked about played into your mind and you were like, well, no, and which wasn't necessarily the bad decision. I mean, we're like, we both, yeah very rich so it's like it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's fine it's fine it's you hard to complain, complain. Yeah. like there's you always have this wonder if you sell something if you don't go for broke on things like well what could have been if we'd gone for broke if we'd really gone for it what would that have looked like and i think that this, when i give advice to founders i'm like you know you don't you have a winner like don't don't sell the winner unless you have like you really don't like don't want to anymore um because even though Everything wound up working out for me. I think I got kind of like the best case acquisition also because like Amazon stock went up a lot after they acquired us. They've been extremely good acquirer. I've gotten tons of independence. Like, but I actually didn't know that when I was selling the company. And when I hear other people's acquisition stories, they are often not so good. Most people I know who sell the companies don't wind up staying at the company as the leader. And so we kind of got lucky on the other side of the Amazon acquisition also. For sure. I mean, Amazon has been a really good partner in that Twitch is been able to do kind of whatever it wants. And there were some other options, right, that were would have not ended out like in the same in the same way. I'm mean, actually so just reflecting on like what if you look at all the acquisitions by the major like you know top five tech companies, the only company that consistently retains CEO founders of the acquisitions of like large acquisitions is Amazon, I think. All right guys, that was my combo with Emmett. You can find him at eShear. That's E-S-H-E-A-R on Twitter. And as always, you can follow me at Justin Khan on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, wherever. Also, we are launching a new newsletter on Substack called The Quest Digest. So check that out in the show notes. Uh, You will be able to find episode summaries, takeaways, and special announcements on our newsletter. And as always, bang out that five-star rating if you like the show. If you didn't like it, hit that five-star rating anyways. Send me feedback on Twitter, and I will see you guys all next week.